use. As many of you know, in 1990, there were numerous errors found in the sampling plan known as the PES. After the census in 1991, the Bureau discovered a computer error in the PES that inflated the undercount by one million people. Then, during a series of evaluations that took almost two years, the Bureau discovered more errors in the PES, leading to even more enumerous enumerations, erroneous enumerations. In 1992, the experts at the Bureau who reviewed the 1990 census estimation plan issued what's known as the CAPE report. These experts reported that, quote, about 45 percent of the revised estimated undercount is actually measured bias and not measured undercount, unquote. In other words, in 1990, almost half of the statistical adjustment was wrong. Once states draw their district lines, you can't come back a year later and say, sorry, we made a mistake, we added or subtracted too many people. If it took almost two years in 1990 to find the errors, how can you ensure that we don't have the same errors this time around? this time in only a few months. From a practical perspective, there is no guarantee that pl this plan is even viable. Despite claims to the contrary, the National Academy of Panel, Panel has not given the ACE a full blessing. While certain groups have endorsed statistical estimation as a concept, this is a far cry from an endorsement of the actual plan. To give you an, an analogy, we all know that it's possible to build a, sa a spaceship to go to the moon or Mars. <coughs> Yet, as with all very complex scientific tasks, and the estimation plan is immensely complex, your spaceship could blow up on the launching pad or burn in the Martian atmosphere, as has happened twice recently. What assurances do we have from the director that their scientific plan won't blow up? Just because something may be theoretically possible doesn't mean it can be done. Despite claims by the Democrats, Republican opposition to the estimation plan is based on fundamental, unresolved problems. Is the plan constitutional? Is it legal? Is it in the best interest of our nation as a whole? And simply, will it work? In January 1999, the Supreme Court ruled that sampling or estimating portions of the population was illegal. Democrats read the decision to outlaw the use of sampling for purposes of apportionment only, while Republicans read the decision to prohibit the use of estimation for redistricting as well. In the wake of that decision, the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service issued an opinion, quote, a closer examination of other parts of the court's opinion indicates that it did not interpret those other purposes as necessarily including at least intrastate redistricting, end quote. Unfortunately, this administration was not going to be deterred by even the Supreme Court. In a political move clearly against the best interests of the nation, the Clinton-Gore administration decided to conduct a two-number census. This unwise decision would clearly throw the states into legal turmoil over the census, the likes of which this nation has never seen. And while the Democrats and their so-called experts have claimed that, this, that it is perfectly legal to use estimation for redistricting, I would simpler, simply offer a few words of caution. These are the same so-called experts that said estimation could be used for apportionment. Those on the estima estimation side of this disagreement have yet to win a court case. The fundamental purpose of the census is to fairly and accurately apportion and distribute political representation. Our political system, for the most part, is the envy of many, nation many other nations. One of the foundations of our system is its relative transparency. Our elections are, are carefully scrutinized and the appeals process clear. If warranted, for example, an election can be challenged, voter registration records can be checked and rechecked, ballots recounted. With estimation, it's simply not possible to verify whether a, or not a person added actually exist, exists or if a, person is, or if a person is subtracted was done so rightfully. Additions and subtractions exist only in a virtual world a world based not in reality, but in the complex mathematical formulas that could be right or wrong and understood only by a few select statisticians and government bureaucrats. Census estimation, no matter who is crunching the numbers, is not a system that lends itself to trust and integrity, two cornerstones of our electoral process. And while we have spent billions of dollars to motivate people to participate in the census, something that all, uh, all sides agree is a civic ceremony, what would motivate someone to participate in the census when they can sit back and be estimated? Why fill out your census form at all if the government will somehow compensate for you anyway? 
And even worse, how can it be acceptable that someone does their civic obligation, fills out their form on time, and sends it in, only to have the government say they count as less than a whole person? Is this not a violation of one man, one vote? Can the director guarantee that every person who filled out a form, and only one form, will be counted as one person and not less? The answer, disturbingly, is no. The fact not widely talked about the Bureau is that there will be people who do everything right, fill out their census forms, send them in on time, and will be counted as less than a whole person. While I fully support expending the resources to reach the undercounted, I wholeheartedly oppose the concept of counting someone as less than a whole person. The census has traditionally been constructed of millions and millions of individuals. However, this estimation plan has introduced a new level of demographic grouping that is very da dangerous in its assumptions. The assumption that people within racial groups act alike and have the same tendencies is something that this nation has been trying to overcome for over 100 years. But now the Census Bureau has gone down that exact path. No longer are we individuals. Now we are white males, 25 to 35, who rent our own. We are Cubans in Miami, Mexicans in Texas, Puerto Ricans in New York, that according to the Census Bureau are all alike and thus are grouped together. We are Asians, including Chinese, Japanese, Koreans from Seattle to Washington, D.C., grouped together like so many clones. The byproducts of this estimation plan are not healthy for our nation. From civic disengagement to simply throwing one man, one vote out the window, we, in the long one, run hurt our nation. While we must do everything possible to eliminate the undercount, we must also remain faithful to our Constitution, the law, and the civic health of our nation. Clearly, this administration is putting politics ahead of sound public policy. Unfortunately, it will take the courts once again to protect the integrity of our census. <coughs> Ms. Maloney. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I must say I, I find the title of today's hearing very curious. It's called Status of the 2000 Census, Accuracy and Coverage Evaluation, still more questions than answers. Yet it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that there are almost no unanswered questions, only questions which you don't like the answers to. Despite the cautious stance taken by the Census Bureau, I believe the 2000 Census may well be the best, fairest, and most accurate census ever, a fitting way to start the 21st century it will be that not just because of the operational successes we have seen to date, because, but because it incorporates modern scientific methods into its design. We all know the problems of the 1990 census. It contained millions of errors and was the first to be less accurate than the census before it. The 1990 census had an error rate of over 10%. 8.4 million people were missed. 4.4 million people were counted twice. And 13 million people were counted in the wrong place. And we know who the people were that were missed. They were children. They were minorities in urban and rural areas. The Census Bureau, working with the National Academy of Science at the direction of Congress in a bipartisan way, has tried to fix these errors. But there are politicians who, for partisan reasons, have tried to make sure that it doesn't happen. They have tried to make sure that minorities and the poor and urban and rural areas and children are not counted. The Census, the Census Bureau first discovered the problem of the undercount during World War II, 60 years ago, when more young men showed up for the draft than the Census Bureau thought existed. For black young men, nearly 13 percent more showed up for the draft than they expected, showing that there was a disproportionate undercount, particularly for minorities. We now know that the people missed in the census are the urban and rural poor and minorities. We also know that the people counted, counted twice are primarily people who are fortunate enough to have two homes. They're suburbanites. Those eras shift 
economic resources, and political representation unfairly. Those who oppose the use of modern scientific methods in the census would ensure that millions of people missed in the census are left out permanently, and the millions of people counted twice are forever kept in. That is fundamentally unfair, and it is unjust, and it must stop. And that is why this census has been called the civil rights issue of the decade. Whether we will correct the knowing people that are left out, whether we will do what every scientist said needs to be done to make sure that they are counted and represented. The closer the Census Bureau has gotten to, to, to developing a way to fix these errors, the harder the opponents of a modern census have worked to stop them. In 1987, the professionals at the Census Bureau proposed a 300,000 household survey to measure and correct for the errors of the census. The politicians at the Reagan Commerce Department stopped that planning dead in its tracks. Correcting the 1990 census would have been stopped for good had not the great city of New York, and I am proud to be a representative from that great city, the city of New York sued. Finally, in late 1989, the Commerce Department allowed planning for the quality control survey to go forward. However, instead of allowing it to be a 300,000 household survey, the politicians at the then President Bush's <coughs> Commerce Department cut it in half, and the secretary reserved the right to block the use of the corrected modern scientific numbers. Not surprisingly, he overruled his own Republican-appointed census director, Dr. Barbara Bryant, and the professional nonpartisans at the Census Bureau, and he did block their use. In 1997, the opponents of a fair and accurate census, they held up a disaster relief bill to the Midwest because they attached language to this important bill that would have prohibited the use of modern scientific methods. They believed that the President of the United States when the country was in disaster, people were suffering, their homes were underwater, that he would not have the nerve to veto the disaster relief bill over the census, over an accurate census. Yet the president vetoed the disaster relief bill over the census because of their crass attempt to manipulate the numbers in the census, and he received editorial support clear across this country, and I would like permission, Mr. Chairman, to put all of those editorials in the record of this hearing. Objection. Okay. In 1997, and again in 1998, opponents of a fair and accurate census, those who did not want minorities and the poor and children and urban and rural areas counted, tried to use the appropriations process, the budget process, to legislate how Census 2000 would be conducted by threatening to hold up two budgets and close down the government. Their attempt to block the use of modern scientific methods failed again. Principally, at the direction of Congress and the National Academy of Sciences, has conducted extensive research and review of the planning and implementation of the 2000 Census throughout the decade of the 1990s. Working with the Census Bureau, four separate panels of independent experts have consistently supported the use of modern scientific statistical methods in general. More recently, a fifth panel the Academy's panel to review the 2000 Census 
has endorsed the Bureau's specific plans for the ACE program in Census 2000. And I would like permission to put in the record the five statistical reports and scientific reports that have come out in support of the Bureau's plans. May they be put in the record? No objection. The overwhelming majority of the scientific community has concluded that if we are not if that we are if that if we are to have a 2000 census that is fair and accounts for all residents of this country regardless of race or economic status it must be a census that uses modern methods <clears throat> and i would now like to put into the record this list of organizations that supports the use of modern scientific statistical methods and it includes uh, all kinds of associations from across this country. Without objection. The General Accounting Office, the Commerce Department's Inspector General, and George Bush's Census Director, Dr. Barbara Bryant, are all on the record in their support. The Census Bureau has presented its plans for the use of modern methods to the scientific community on a continuing basis since 1996. This subcommittee and the Census Monitoring Board have been kept appraised of those plans since their inception. And the Secretary's 2000 Census Advisory Committee, Race and Ethnic Advisory Committees, and Census Advisory Committee of Professional Associations have all been briefed on these plans as well. Again, Mr. Chairman, these aren't their there are not any unanswered questions about the ACE program, only answers that the Republican Conference and the RNC doesn't like. I have um, heard the opponents of modern methods say repeatedly that they are a, quote, risky experimental plan that is inaccurate, that all we need to do is use old methods and try really hard to just count everyone, end quote. Well, the only thing that is risky is not using modern methods. Over the course of the years working on this issue, I have repeatedly heard from people, how do you know that you missed people? How do you know that there is an undercount? Well, the Census Bureau is unique among government agencies in that they tell you how well they have done. And the only way we know that the 1990 census was less accurate than the one before it was the 1990 post-enumeration survey, the use of modern statistical methods. And the only way we will be able to determine the most accurate count for the 2000 census is from the results of the ACE program, the use of modern statistical methods. In the end, it is only through those methods that we will have the most accurate census possible. I would um, also like to comment um, briefly on the Supreme Court case. Very simply, in the Supreme Court case, the Republicans won one and the Democrats won two. The, re the court held that you could not use modern scientific methods for the apportionment of seats between the states, but if at all fe feasible, you could use it for the distribution of federal funds, which is tremendously important since the federal government distributes over $185 billion a year based on funding formulas that are tied to census numbers. That means that over $3 trillion in the next decade will be distributed on these uh, numbers and we need to make them accurate. And they also held that it could be uh, used for redistricting within the states. And that is why we have to come forward with two numbers, one for reapportionment between the states and one for redistricting and the distribution of funds. I'd also like to, Mr. Chairman, uh, briefly comment on the email uh, that you made public last <coughs> week. Mr. Chairman, I, I continue to believe that it was inappropriate to make this public without first talking to its author especially since you used it to imply a vast conspiracy by the census to hide information from Congress. 
and I, I remain disturbed by the fact that I had little more than an hour's notice of this email's existence prior to our hearing, and I still am disturbed that GAO, a supposedly nonpartisan independent body, contacted the staff of the majority, but did not contact the staff of the Democratic minority. The email may be poorly worded, but after speaking to its author, I called the gentleman. He is a honest, hard-working American. He is a former Marine. He is working very hard now for his country on this great civic ceremony, the census. I, I believe him that he made an honest mistake and, and it is not in any way evidence of a systemic attempt to deny information to Congress. Uh, nevertheless, it, it seems to have raised questions in your mind which should be put to rest. Therefore, I have written to the controller of, of GAO asking him to investigate this incident as soon as possible and to have the GAO, GAO determine if there is an intentional systemic attempt to hide information from Congress. I'd like to introduce that letter into the record. I'd like to thank uh, the chairman, and I would also like to put into the record, since at times this issue has been called partisan, and regrettably, sometimes it has been partisan in our comments. So therefore, to bring the debate above a partisan level, I would like to introduce into the record all of the editorials from across this country in support of the Census Bureau's plans, in support of the use of modern scientific methods to correct the undercount, and it comes from the Miami Herald, the Houston Chronicle, uh, newspapers all across this country. Is that? I think, I think I've already accepted that. Thank you. Yeah. Finish? Finish. Uh, um, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Ryan, before you, if I take some of your time, um, it might take more than 30 seconds. Um, uh, when you mentioned the editorials, uh, there's a very large number of editorials opposed to the concept of statistical adjust adjustment and manipulation, and I ask uh, consent that we include those in the record, and without objection, those editorials will be included. Um, I'm glad you talk about uh, getting away from the partisanship, but it's something you make a statement, and it really bothers me to say, claim, Ms. Maloney, that we don't want to count people. This sense Congress has provided every penny and provided all the resources the Bureau has asked to get everybody counted. That is our objective. That is our goal. And we are not trying to do not want count people. And to say that is just political rhetoric. So there's, I would just want to make sure we clear the record. Let me clear one other record, and that is the question about scientific endorsement. Um, the National Academy of Sciences panel to review the 2000 census has not endorsed the ACE. I had a long meeting with Janet Norwood only two days ago, and she stated emphatically several times that neither she nor any member of the panel has made any determination as to the quality or outcome of the ACE. She explained what is quite obvious to most people, that you can't evaluate a statistical process if one, is, it's not complete, and two, you don't have the data. So stop, please stop misrepresenting the truth here. The ACE is a statistical plan but at the moment is mostly just that, a plan. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me follow up on this. Uh, we are going into that touchy part of the census where I think we have done very remarkable accomplishments in the enumeration process. And I'm excited about hearing more about how well the enumeration is working. But now we are getting into that touchy area. And now we are hearing the kinds of discussions, the kind of political rhetoric that is unfortunate. First of all, it's not all Democrats against all Republicans. Democrats in my home state of Wisconsin are against sampling because they know it is not good for the state of Wisconsin. So I object to the characterization that opposition to the ACE plan means opposition to counting people. The same people who oppose the ACE plan, Mr. the chairman and myself, are the same people who have provided $7 billion to improve the census, especially in the traditionally undercounted areas and communities in the inner cities. $7 billion provided for advertising, $7 billion provided for partnership, hiring f that far exceeded any previous census. So saying that the people who provided these resources don't want the people to be counted is wrong and it's actually racially divisive. Post-census local review, 
We passed that out of Congress. We can't get it signed into law. Post-census local review, in my opinion, is a very good idea. It simply says in those hard to count areas, the inner city of Milwaukee, the inner city of New York, please look at the data, local elected officials. Tell us if we missed anybody. Did we miss a public housing complex? Do we miss a neighborhood that's tough to, to reach? Do we miss a Latino neighborhood that didn't want to comply with the census? If so, we'll go back and get those people counted. That's a very common sense idea. It's a common sense idea that was supported in 1990 by Democrats and Republicans alike. The mayor of Chicago, uh, mayors all across the city, supported a common sense idea like post-census local review. We passed post-census local review to try and improve the count, to try and make sure that those people who are historically undercounted get counted that local officials, mayors, county board members, city council people, pastors in, in inner city churches, the data before it's finalized and to make sure that their citizens weren't missed. Well, this administration blocks post-census local review. We don't have post-census local review. LUCA was a good idea. LUCA worked well, but it can be improved upon. I still think we should do post-census local review. So to suggest that those of us who have questions about the statistical adjustment are somehow against getting the most accurate census is, is a ridiculous claim, number one. Number two, the scientific community is, is clearly not unified on this point. So also to suggest that the scientific community is completely behind statistical sampling is, is not correct. I have a letter here from the Statistics Department of, of the University of Berkeley in, in California, uh, Dr. David Freeman and Kenneth Walter. I did ask unanimous consent that this letter be inserted to the record. Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> also, the National Academy of Sciences has not endorsed the ACE plan. So to suggest that the scientific community believes that this is a unified point, that's, that's just not the case. Sampling didn't work in 1990. We found that years later we had dire problems. So one thing that I think today's hearing hopefully we can get into is the, the compressed timeline that this plan involves. I'm concerned that this, this rushed timeline is going to give us the errors that we will f discover down the road when it's too late. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield back the balance of my time. Um, m with my, my friend from New York, uh, the National Academy of Sciences hasn't officially endorsed the, the ACE plan. Uh, the scientific community is divided on this. So I hope that we can move forward on an even keel, on an objective basis, and I hope that we won't get into this heightened political rhetoric where we are impugning the motives of each of the two parties involved. All of us want an accurate count. All of us want everybody to be counted in the neighborhoods where they live. Uh, Democrats and Republicans in Wisconsin want that. All of us want that. So let's keep the discussion at that level, if we may. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I, I uh, request permission to Mr. respond. Davis yields time I, I yeah. think that I should uh, be able to respond. Mr. Davis gives some time. I yield time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very briefly, I, I feel that we should let the facts speak for themselves. So I would like to put into the record the legislation, bipartisan, that went, that passed, calling on the National Academy of Sciences to come forward with a plan to correct the undercount. <coughs> the plan that they came back with which was the use of modern scientific methods. I would like to put into the record the language that the Republican majority attached to the disaster relief bill that would have prohibited the use of modern scientific methods. I would like to put in the record that the Republican majority tried to attach to two budget bills holding up two budgets that would have limited and prohibited the use of modern scientific methods. The facts speak for themselves, and I will put that in the record, and it is clear, and it is clear what the intention of such actions would do and how it would affect and continue an undercount. Knowingly, the majority tried to stack the deck so that millions of Americans would be intentionally left out of representation and funding dollars in this country. It is unfair. It is unjust. It is the civil rights issue of this decade. What would the gentleman yield just for an honest point of clarification, not a, not a tit for tat, just an honest point of clarification? Claim in my time, I'll yield. Okay, thank you, Denny. Appreciate it. Uh, that was two years ago in the last Congress. That was then. 
this is now, let's move forward with, with not a hot political rhetoric, let's move forward and, and debate this objectively, and let's not impugn the motives of each other. We all want an accurate count. With that, I yield. Thank you for yielding time. Reclaiming my time. Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for convening this hearing regarding oversight of the 2000 census and the impact of the accuracy and coverage evaluation, that is, the ACE process. As enumerators began the process of going door to door to those households that, that did not send in their census forms, it is important that we examine the ACE operations. The ACE process was added to the 2000 census to replace the post-enumeration survey of 1990 in an effort to improve the accuracy of the census. We all know that accuracy must be the goal. We can ill afford to go back to the days of 1990 when too many people lost from an inaccurate census. The constituents of my district, the 7th Congressional District in Illinois, deserve and need an accurate count of the entire population. They realize that too much is at stake to get a less than accurate count. In 1990, Chicago lost millions of dollars in federal funds because of a census undercount. According to the Bureau, at least 10 million people, including at least 113,831 in the state of Illinois, 81,000 in Cook County, and 68,000 in the city of Chicago were not counted in the 1990 census. Many of those missed were obviously children and women who live in minority communities. Because the 1990 census missed counted millions of people in Chicago, every one of our residents were shortchanged on money to repair roads and streets. They were shortchanged on money for mass transit and senior citizen homes. They were shortchanged on money for schools, parks, and job training. Perhaps the most egregious short change was that of political representation. And in a democracy, representation is essential to having a voice in local, state, and federal government. I represent many hard-to-count people. According to the Census Bureau, 165,000 of them live at or below the poverty level in my district. And so I'm pleased that we're holding these hearings in an effort to make certain that the Census Bureau and others are doing everything possible to get an accurate count. Yes, many people are indeed difficult to count. Therefore, we must use every effort to try and make sure that the past evils and transgressions of our nation do not continue to negatively impact upon the reality of our being. And if there's to be fairness, we must indeed make use of every method available to us. Just two days ago, the mayor of my city, Mayor Daley, announced a $400,000 radio and television advertising campaign to be funded by the city to encourage people to cooperate and participate in the 2000 census. This advertising campaign coupled with what the Census Bureau has already committed to will go a long way towards a more accurate census. However, I tell you that you cannot undo with radio and television ads what 400 years of slavery, deprivation, discrimination, denial of equal opportunity, lack of opportunity to be educated, to understand, to be a part of the mainstream, you cannot undo that with radio, television, and newspaper advertising. You cannot even undo it by sending people door to door, looking for people that you cannot find. 
people who in many instances are unreachable, untouchable, and unfindable. And I don't care how much we put in, unless we make absolutely certain that every available technique, every scientific advancement, every opportunity exists to count every single person account for every single person in this country, then we once again will come up lacking. Once again, individuals will be left out. Once again, individuals will be shortchanged. And once again, this nation will have shortchanged itself. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that we're having this hearing and look forward to the information that Dr. Pruitt will share with us. And so I thank you and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, you do outline the real challenges of this massive undertaking that, that we're in the process of. Uh, see, Mr. Dr. Pruitt, if you and Mr. Hogan and Mr. Thompson would stand and raise your right hand, we'll get you sworn in and proceed. Uh, in case Mr. Thompson and Mr. Hogan is needed to assist you, uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give be before the subcommittee of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, and please be seated. The record will reflect that Mr. Thompson, Mr. Hogan, and Dr. Pruitt answered in the affirmative. Um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you may proceed with the opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I did uh, solicit the Chairman's permission this morning to spend just a few minutes uh, uh, returning to the uh, email incident that was addressed last week at the subcommittee hearing with the GAO, and I've also informed the minority. Um, and, and also the leader and also uh, Mr. Mr. Davis and Mr. Ryan that would like to address that quickly. Um, I'd like to start by saying that it is quite uh, understandable that in the absence of facts, uh, the offending sentence uh, instructing the LCO managers not to share a given report with the JO could have led to the strong reaction of the chairman of Congressman Ryan and of Mr. Mim of the GAO. Uh, but the facts do, in fact, mitigate uh, this reaction, and I would like to quickly put them in the record. And here I paraphrase from a subsequent email by Mr. Rodriguez, who was the author of that uh, initial email. The report in question, he explains, is a regional level report, and information from it should be shared only by the regional level. It, in turn, generates local office reports, and it is this information that, be, that can be shared by local managers. As he writes in a subsequent uh, uh, email uh, to us, that as per our instructions on May 8th, at about 3 p.m., the D33, 333D report, the offending report, uh, not the offending report, but the one that initiated the incident, was to be shared at the area managed discretion with their local census offices, but any one local census office was not to share it, uh, the production information of a different LCO. That is, each LCO was only to share its own production information and not other uh, uh, patterns of information. If anyone outside the Census Bureau wanted to obtain a regional level report, they can get that from the regional census center. Um, and then he goes on to explain why he sent the report he did. My intentions were to provide the uh, report to my offices as a tool to encourage friendly competition and thereby productivity, nothing more. I regret that my intentions have been misinterpreted, and rightly so, because of the way my email was worded. And I apologize for any inconvenience I may have caused. I would like to say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that obviously I join in, in that apology. Um, but nevertheless, I uh, do want to make certain that we understand that the facts themselves uh, give no warrant for the accusation that the Census Bureau is preventing the GAO from discharging its responsibilities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we have taken this accusation so seriously that yesterday, with Deputy Director William Barron, I met with David Walker, the Controller General, with Nancy Kingsbury, and with Chris Mim to reiterate the Census Bureau policy in regard to access. 
And uh, I do believe that we all fully understand that there's nothing in our policies that are designed to uh, prevent any access by the GAO. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, more than a week ago, uh, at the subcommittee hearing to which I've not referred, you said that there were Census Bureau employees, and I quote, in very influential positions who are dangerous. This I take as a very serious charge. If substantiated, I would take corrective action. Obviously, if I am myself the person who is dangerous, then I would expect you to bring that to the attention of the Secretary, and he would take corrective action. In that same hearing, you asked the GAO to investigate the incident that led you to make this extremely serious charge. Yesterday, I asked David Walker, Walker, Controller General of the GAO, if his organization had any evidence that would corroborate your charge that the Census Bureau has people in very influential positions who are dangerous. He replied in the negative, and in this he was seconded by Christopher Mim, who also was present at the meeting. Mr. Chairman, it is now more than a week after your charge. I know that you and your staff have conducted your own independent investigation. And I wait for the evidence on which this accusation is based, for I am unable to take corrective action until I know who these people are and what it is that makes them dangerous. So I may I respectfully request that you please provide me as soon as possible the names of the dangerous people, the nature of the danger they pose, and of course the evidence that would substantiate this charge, and I promise to you that I will take corrective action. Thank you, sir. Now, if I may, I'll turn to my uh, opening comments on the uh, topic of this hearing. Since this 2000 operations continue on track and on budget, I earlier reported that the mailback response rate at 66% was very encouraging. And in my written testimony, I indicated that we had completed 39% of the non-response follow-up workload. I would like to update that number through yesterday. The workload is now 50% complete. Putting these two numbers together, the census enumeration is now approximately 85% complete. That is, 85% of the housing units have now responded, or we have identified them as vacants. Still, the Census Bureau does not anticipate at this point that Census 2000 will have better coverage than the 1990 census, because many of the factors that led to the undercount in 1990 are still present in American society. And indeed, as a proportion of the population have grown, more gated communities, more recent immigrants, more linguistically isolated households, more persons living in irregular housing, and perhaps more anger toward the government. The Census Bureau has both measured and documented the existence of a substantial undercount since 1940, and this has already been referenced in the opening comments. The Census Bureau has been running harder, but believes this will only allow us to stay even. That is, we expect that neither the overall coverage levels nor the differential undercount rates in Census 2000 will show improvement over 1990. The Census Bureau strongly hopes to be proven wrong in this assessment, and the ACE will give us the information to determine whether this is so. The ACE provides a final quality check on how well we have done in the initial census. The alternative is not to do the ACE and never know how we have done below the national level where demographic analysis does provide a benchmark. The ACE also provides the means to generate a more accurate count. The 1990 version of the ACE, or the Accuracy and Coverage Evaluation, was called the Post Enumeration Survey. It provided information that was used during the 1990s to improve statistical programs. The population estimates that the Bureau of Labor Statistics asked us to incorporate into the current population survey program following the 1990 census were corrected for the undercount identified through the 1990 PES. The Bureau of Labor Statistics also requested adjusted population controls for the Consumer Expenditure Survey. All other major national demographic surveys conducted by the Census Bureau for other agencies of the federal statistical system also were converted to this adjusted population base. And the Catherine Abr Abram Abraham, the, the current commissioner, of course, uh, testifies that in the absence of this correction, uh, their published demographic distribution of unemployment and other measures would have been inaccurate. We believe we have an obligation to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the many, many other users of our data products to make our data as accurate as possible. 
I have said previously that the Census Bureau currently expects that the corrected numbers using the accuracy and coverage evaluation will be the more accurate numbers. If the Census Bureau does not have confidence in the results, we will not use them. The decision whether to release the statistically corrected data should take into consideration operational data to validate the successful conduct of the ACE, whether the ACE measurements of undercount are consistent with historical patterns of undercount, and a review of selected measures of quality. In the fall of this year, the Census Bureau will discuss the review process and criteria with the statistical community and other interested parties. We will set forth how we will assess whether our operational assumptions for the ACE were met. All major operations have been designed and documented, and the details have been available for review and comment. Every document requested by the subcommittee has been forwarded. Here, however, Mr. Chairman, is a complete set. It is possible that there are documents here that you have not yet requested, uh, but we can provide you the entire complete set of our decision documents that go into the design of the ACE. Um, now let me very quickly try to describe the operations as requested in your invitation letter. Several major uh, op operations have now been completed. One is ongoing and others will follow the completion of non-response follow-up. All operations are currently on schedule. The basic concept behind the ACE is the comparison of data from two systems, an independent survey and the initial census. Because of its small size relative to the initial census, we believe we can do a better job enumerating people in the housing units in the sample. We can be more selective about the interviewers, train them longer, pay them more, and provide more quality assurance. The first step in the ACE process is to design and select the sample, which consists of approximately 314,000 housing units, or about one-fourth of one percent of the to total housing units. The basic units of this sample are what we call block clusters, uh, and there will be about 11,800 block clusters in our sample. The sample was designed and selected to provide sufficient precision to estimate the true population for various groupings of the population that we call post strata, uh, which I will describe below. The next step in the process is to create an independent listing of housing units. By independent, we mean that we do not start with or refer to the master address file from Census 2000, but instead have Census staff systematically canvass the block clusters to list the addresses. Uh, this operation was completed in the fall of 1999. Uh, checked in, keyed, and 100% quality controlled in our National Processing Center. Uh, the Census Bureau then matches this list of housing to the uh, master address file, first by computer and then clerically if necessary, uh, and using this additional information continues to improve our, our uh, address list. Uh, the purpose of this housing unit match is to create an accurate length list of housing units in the block cluster. This work was also completed on schedule. To provide sufficient data to compare the ACE to the initial census, the Census Bureau, of course, must conduct interviews to collect data from each of the housing units that were independently listed. We initiated the ACE interview with a telephone phase using laptop computers in a technique we call computer-assisted personal interviewing. interviewing. And uh, this is the uh, laptop computer that we're using in that procedure. And we would be delighted, of course, to provide a staff briefing of how it is used. We began in late April telephoning households uh, in the ACE sample at uh, unique addresses for which a Census 2000 questionnaire had been mailed back, processed through data capture, and for which a telephone number was provided. As of today, we have completed over 60,000 interviews by telephone. That is more than 20% of our workload for the ACE. In addition to getting an early start on interviewing, the benefits include providing experience for our supervisors and final test of our automated system. And the Bureau, of course, has had extensive experience with telephone interviewing. Uh, we designed this phase of the ACE uh, based upon our testing of the methodology in the dress rehearsal. As you know, we do not begin personal visit interviewing until nearly all non-response follow work is completed in all the ACE block clusters in an LCO. This is one of the ways we preserve independence between the ACE and the census. Uh, if non-response follow-up and ACE field interviews are working in the same area simultaneously, they could affect each other's work. And that's why we wait to complete non-response follow-up before starting the personal visits. Interviewers, whether on the telephone or personal visit, focus on reconstructing the Census Day household, that is determining who lived at the address on Census Day at the time of the uh, ACE interview, and collecting as much information as possible for those who lived at the address on Census Day, but have moved out. And then we have special procedures, of course, for movers. Uh, all of these interviewers will use the, uh, the CAPI technique. 
This is a technique that improves the accuracy of the operation because it permits a more structured interview and more probing questions. We have extensive processes for conducting quality assurance to identify data quality or falsification problems, though for data quality purposes we do not widely publicize these processes. Most personal interviewing will be conducted in late July and August, but some may begin in mid to late June. Personal interviews are conducted only with a household member during the first three weeks that the case is available. If an interview is not obtained after three weeks, interviewers will attempt to interview another knowledgeable person. <clears throat> and during this latter part, we use our very best interviewers, of course, who are trained to uh, convert uh, reluctant respondents. We then do person matching. This will occur in October and November. Uh, Census Bureau staff conduct the various stages of the matching persons listed. Uh, in, uh, in the ACE interviewing with the initial census. And we have designed, of course, these matching processes to minimize errors. Incorrect matching determinations generally result from incomplete, inaccurate, or conflicting data, or from poor judgment. And so we have several stages at which we conduct this matching process, each with its own quality assurance uh, process. We then, of course, turn to dual system estimation. We use data from the ACE and the census to estimate the true population using a statistical technique called dual system estimation. The uh, DSE will be conducted for each of over 400 groupings of people or post strata. The dual system estimator of true population is then used to calculate a coverage correction factor for each post stratum, which is the ratio of the DSE to the initial census count. The variables that define the post rate of grouping include race, ethnicity, age, sex, owner, non-owner, return rates, whether in or out of a metropolitan area, and if in, the size of the area, the type of census enumeration method. Characteristics that our research indicates are correlated with a likelihood of inclusion in the census. An example of one post stratum is non-Hispanic black males aged 18 to 29 and non-owner units in mail-out, mail-back areas of metropolitan areas with 500,000 or more people in a track with a low return rate in the census. Coverage correction factors then applied to the census files. For example, if the coverage correction factor for a non-Hispanic black male in the specific post datum described above is 1.02, this means the Census Bureau measured an undercount of 2% for this post datum, and for every 100 people counted in the census in these areas, two records will be added. This process is sometimes called synthetic estimation. After this, the corrected census file can be used to produce the corrected tabulation for all uses of census data. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've tried to give a rather simple and quick basic description of the ACE uh, and the documents listed in the appendix. And of course, this fuller set of documents uh, can be uh, uh, <coughs> investigated for any more detailed questions that you might have. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Director Pruitt. I, I'm not going to enter all that in the record or make it too long and lengthy, so I appreciate, I'll, uh, appreciate having the access to that. Uh, let me briefly make a comment about the issue of transparency and openness, and I, I hope, like you, that we get beyond this very quickly. Uh, however, let me just explain the foundation for my concerns. Issues of transparency and access go right to the heart of, why, of one of the reasons why I called this hearing today. The census is like a business placing an order. Last year, the Congress placed a $7 billion order with the Census Bureau. This Congress has done everything it can to make sure that we had the money to pay. Now the inventory is coming in, and I'm equally re responsible to those senators and representatives and the people they represent to make sure we get what we paid for. It is my job to check the inventory. It is also the job of the GA GAO, the Monitoring Board, and the Inspector General and the National Academy of Sciences to review the 2000 Census. Unfortunately, when I try to check the inventory, the Bureau tells me I can't open certain boxes, or I've got to wait three weeks while they check with headquarters, or there are some boxes that are off limits. And let me give you a few examples. Last year, the Bureau refused to provide this, this subcommittee with data from the 1990 census. They claimed it was protected by Title 13, and it wasn't, and we are all sworn anyway, but the result was a delay to delay the request for months. The Bureau also delayed providing information requested by, for the dress rehearsal for an entire year, effectively preventing analysis. Two months ago, I entered into the record a list of information requested by the monitoring board that were delayed by more than 60 days or refused. The Bureau also produced a set of guidelines that limited access to local offices by the GAO, the board, and the subcommittee. And just last week, we received a copy of an email that gave me and my staff and representatives of the GAO reason to believe a Bureau employee was instructed to withhold information and was instructing subordinates to do the same. 
This w week, I received a letter from the director requesting that I not call any bureau employees without a Democratic staffer or, of the, or a member of the bureau present. Is this what is meant by transparent census free from political manipulation? If this is the routine during the relatively simple census, delayed information, limited access, and obstructed investigations, how can we have confidence in the extremely complex statistical adjustment? How can we honestly say this process is free from political manipulation if we're not allowed to review the process? Or if we're only allowed to look at certain parts of it under certain conditions with proper supervision of Democrats and Bureau employees? These developments are, not, are increasingly troubling and do not add to the credibility of this or future decennial censuses. I, my comments certainly do not reflect on you, Director Pruitt, and I think the, the people be behind you. Uh, the nature of the concern is there is a contempt for Congress and the re responsibility that we as the elected officials have for overseeing not only the $7 billion of the census, but the critical role the census is for our entire electoral process. It is rare that we have a copy of an email like that, and it is legitimate for us to be looking at that. Let me t make another comment about the use of the PES and uh, the B BLS adjusted numbers. For My understanding is that the BLS accepted adjusted numbers for very large areas, national populations, and for large states. Uh, but you are proposing releasing adjusting num adjusted numbers for every state, county, city, and block in the country. That is a completely different use of the numbers than what BLS is using. At small levels of geography, adjusted numbers are not reliable. In fact, the Census Bureau does not use the adjusted numbers, which raises the question of, I see in your statement, instead of using adjusted numbers, you're starting using corrected numbers, which implies that you've already decided that the adjustments are, are the correct ones which to me almost politicizes the use of that word. So I'm concerned that you start saying, well, this is the corrected one. You've obviously made a decision, or not obviously, but apparently when you start, instead of calling it adjusted numbers, you're using corrected numbers. And that is a political way to refer to those numbers. Dr. Bryant, the director of the Census Bureau in 1990, originally supported adjusting the, the national numbers. But she decided not to adjust the interessential estimates after extensive evaluation by the CAPE committee showed the 1990 adjustment was 45% error. Let me read from her decision, quote, this is from the CAPE report. Um, work suggests, the CAPE committee's work suggests that no survey, either the high quality, well controlled and interviewed 1990 PES of 170,000 households or a larger one, can be used to make a post census fine tuning of, of an average undercount as small as 1.6% in all types of places, counties and states. Given that there is little or no evidence adjustment would improve the quality of sub-state estimates other than for a limited number of large places, the decision is not to adjust, end quote. This is, a December, is, is, is from the December 1992 Federal Register, which I'd like to enter into the record and without objection it will be inclu included in the record. Uh, Director Pruitt, if you plan to release adjusted numbers at the block level, please be prepared to defend the accuracy at that level. Don't tell me that because some agencies have elected to use adjusted numbers at the national level, we should adjust the population for all six million blocks across the country. A part of your statistical design hinges on using race, age, and other characteristics to characterize people on what you call post strata. For example, one category would be Asian women living in small metropolitan ages, areas age 30 to 49 renting their living space. And while the exact number has changed several times, I believe the current design is made up of 448 such uh, categories. And is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. In these post strata or profiles, when you say Asian, do you make a distinction between Japanese, Chinese, Laotians, Koreans, or other Asian cultures? No, is, do you make a distinction between Japanese, Chinese, Laotians, Koreans, or others, or is it all just Asian? It's all Asian. I mean, about how Hispanics. Do you lump together Cuban Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, and Mexican Americans? Yes, sir. And they're all Asian. No, and so the assumption Hispanic. is, Hispanic. I mean, I'm sorry, they're all Hispanic. Uh, and, uh, and so the assumption is they all respond in a similar manner. Correct. Um, I find that assumption. little, hmm? That is the assumption, yes. They that is the, the assumption. Same, they have similar capture probabilities is how we would put it. Well, so the Cubans in Miami, the Puerto Ricans in New York, the Hispanics in Houston or Los Angeles all have the same characteristic response rates. The Guatemalans or Hondurans in Miami, they all have the same as the Cubans. And 
they I, I find that hard to understand and grasp that the, you know, I think if you talk to the Cubans in Miami or the uh, uh, Mexicans in Los Angeles, they're going to may not totally agree with that, that they're all homogeneous, as you assume. No, I say that they all have the same capture probability, which is to say the chances of, of enumerating them in the basic census are roughly uh, similar. Now, let us make certain we understand that we're not just talking about Cubans or Hispanics, we're also talking about about 17 or 16 other sets of characteristics. Do they own? Do they rent? Um, uh, what is their age? What is their gender? Uh, so it's not simply the ethnic or racial characteristics, it's a cluster of characteristics that create a post-stratum. Um, as I understand, the post-stratum design adjustments to various categories will be applied in the same way across the entire nation. For example, Hispanic men age 18 to 29 in large cities in rental housing in areas with high male return rates. As I read that, it sounds like as long as they fit that description, Cubans living in Tampa will get the same adjustment as Mexicans living in Houston's and Puerto Ricans living in New York and so on across the country. That is correct. Yeah, it turns out they have very similar capture probabilities. That's why it's correct. All right. Let me ask you about Puerto Rico. You have 84 separate post-trade specifications for Puerto Rico. Is that right? Uh, yeah, for Puerto Rico, 84 post-trade. checking. Right okay. Um, if, if, if you, all right, we'll get clever. Okay, we, my understanding there is 84, but, um, and I, I clarify, does Puerto Rico have these separate strata, but Texas, California, Chicago, New York have, are treated separately, or how is that? I mean, why don't we have separate classifications um, or post strata for Texas, California, or Chicago, or New York City, but we have all these strata classifications for Puerto Rico? Um, why is Puerto Rico singled out? Uh, I mean, they're, they're you know, all Hispanic or almost all Hispanic, but, um, but then we do. Yeah. Well, let me a answer, uh, before okay. we turn to Puerto Rico, uh, address the first part of, of, of your question. Can I just go back a bit? You've asked an, a large number of questions in, in, uh, in, to get to this very particular one. Um, and I don't want to readdress all the access questions, but I do think that um, uh, nearly every one of those things that you mentioned in your response on the access question have been answered before and can continue to be answered. Uh, we talked about a terabyte of information, 52 million uh, uh, yellow pages uh, e worth of, of, of information. Uh, we've met repeatedly with the GAO and the monitoring board. There are no access questions, there are no transparency questions that I know to be on the table uh, right now, sir. And uh, you, you chide us about having guidelines. On the other hand, you, you were the one who asked me in hearing to please create some guidelines that we could all sort of understand so we could move forward in this census without disrupting it. So uh, I, I find it a little odd that now we ha try to have some guidelines and we're chided for that. So it's kind of, you know, either way. I, I, would, I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased me, that... Yes, I mean, it's yeah. interesting that you've given me guidelines on my behavior. I mean, that's, you, no. my letter that you received the other day is you're telling me how to, who I can call and who can has to be present at a phone call. That's a little, you know. Well, I guess in our experience, I guess, you know, uh, Mr. I'm, Chairman. I'm the elected representative no, of the people. Of course, you, you can do whatever you want. Obviously, you can do whatever you want and will do whatever you want. Uh, we then get pressure from uh, the minority wanting to make exactly the same calls. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know whether you want to call 100 people and put them on tape or, or 10 people or 200 people. Uh, and just to sort of manage the process, which is what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to finish the census. It seems kind of reasonable for us to say, if possible, let's try to coordinate these phone calls. But no, you can call anyone you want to in the country. We'll give you a, the phone number of 500,000 employees. Uh, it's very but, easy to locate the gentleman in question, and he was, yeah, you know, yeah. being very pleasant on the phone. But I'm very pleased. Proceed, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm also very pleased that you made reference to the fact this was a rare email. Of course, it's rare. Uh, the, the, that's why uh, you had to uh, pay such attention to it because there's not a pattern of such emails. But but back to the ACE. Um, you um, you said in your your opening comments um, that uh, the. Bureau of Labor Statistics use the data at the national level and, and state level and other sub 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 state levels, but primarily you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, I'd just like to make certain that you understand that the um, the Census Bureau believes that local area data are unstable, irrespective of whether they're corrected or not. We think that the apportionment number, which is based upon the basic enumeration, is unstable at the local level. We don't have a whole lot of confidence in block level data, period, however they are collected. Because it's the nature of very small area data that that's where errors can get magnified. 
So we are just as worried about block level data pre-adjusted or pre-corrected as we are post-adjusted and post-corrected. It's just a fact of the nature of statistical operations. So when you, when you say that we have to be absolutely correct at the local level, we would, if, if that were the standard, we would not be able to give this country the uh, redistricting data based upon the initial census because we, we couldn't stand behind that data at every local level. Just couldn't do it. So it, it's not an issue of whether it's adjusted or unadjusted. Which is more it's, correct, which is more accurate. The, at the block level, the actual count or the adjusted, or you want to call the corrected number oh, at uh, the block level, uh, which uh, is more accurate? Undoubtedly, the adjusted number is more accurate across uh, at the... At the block uh, level? Oh, yes, absolutely. At the, at the, at the block at the, level, we're missing, we know, in certain blocks in Chicago, heavily uh, uh, comprised of African Americans who rent their housing, uh, who are young males, we're missing a very large number of them. We so know that's very, very... You've already decided, then, that the adjustment is going forward, and that's going to be more accurate, the adjusted numbers at the block level. No, sir, Why did the Census Bureau not use the adjusted numbers for the inter-census okay. estimates? Why did the BLS use it only for national numbers or very large state numbers and not for the, I mean, every, and we've all used the, the unadjusted numbers. Yep. Now you're saying it's more accurate uh, or corrected, the political term you've been told you're using. Well. I'm sorry that you've uh, concerned about that. We use the word adjusted and corrected interchangeably. Uh, well, we don't, we don't corrected mean, is a new use of the word, I think. I mean, you've been using adjusted, and I think that's the more appropriate. Well, I've been using the word corrected since I got here. I, I, you know, I'm happy to use whatever set of terms you want. Uh, they're interchangeable as far as we are concerned. Um, uh, the decision has not been made, sir. The decision that has been made is to proceed with the ACE uh, 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 procedure. Indeed, as I said, we're now over 20% finished with the collection of the data. Uh, we have theoretical reasons for believing that this will produce more accurate numbers. We also have to test the operations. Your concern about whether uh, this is a spaceship to Mars that may blow up uh, is an understandable concern. That's also true of the census. It's also true of the enumeration. Any one of our operations could have blown up we're very pleased that we're now about 85% finished with the census, and it hasn't blown up. And we've had many, many hearings about why that is so. We're really very pleased with the operational robustness of this census. But it's not in the nature of one operation versus another operation that it can run into difficulties. Any operation can run into difficulties, uh, including a new operation, not a new, but an operation we haven't talked about in this subcommittee called the Coverage Improvement Follow-Up, which is going to have 7.5 million households in it. We haven't done that one yet. It may not work well. If it doesn't work well, that will have an impact upon the quality of the apportionment numbers. <laughs> so it's not something special about the ACE which makes it vulnerable. Any big complex field operation is vulnerable. The good news is we're 85% finished with a census without having had one. We've still got 15% to go. And it's a very, very hard 15% because we're now down to the difficult cases. So that's, we have not made the decision. We have made the decision that based upon Statistical theory, capture-recapture technologies are able to improve a basic count. That's the decision we've made, and that we've designed an operation to do that. Well, I'm, I think we're all pleased that the, the, the uh, full enumeration is proceeding as it is. I mean, I think the, from the male response rates to uh, the uh, non-response follow-up is proceeding uh, I apparently ahead of schedule, and that, that's the positive thing. But ACE. Uh, or ACE is uh, there's legitimate differences within the statistical community as you're well aware of and uh, to say that this is all uh, is already going to be the corrected number and the other one's an incorrect number by inference and when you say one's correct that means the other one's incorrect uh, is, is politicizing the process and that's unfortunate. Ms. Maloney. Okay. Thank, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, 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 I feel that uh, the chairman often will invoke a person's name who's not here and use it as evidence, and they're not here to speak for themselves. He did it last week with Mr. Rodriguez, the Marine, the, the civil servant, the young man who was working in the census office. He wasn't here to speak for himself. Now we have his written letters. We know what he said. But earlier, he uh, mentioned the names of Dr. Barbara Bryant, the census director un under former President Bush. And let's have her here come here and speak for herself on how she feels about modern scientific methods. And 
he mentioned the name uh, of Dr. Janet Norwood and his conversation with uh, Dr. Janet Norwood from the National Academy of Sciences implying that she did not support the plan of the agency. Well, may I um, suggest respectfully that we invite Dr. Norwood to come and speak for herself. I have a May 3rd, 1999 letter from Dr. Norwood that I would like uh, put in the record that appears to indicate that she supports the, the plan of the agency. And I quote, in general, the, the panel concludes that the ACE design work to date is well considered. It represents good current practice in both sample design and, and post design, as well as the interrelationship between the two, end quote. And I'd like to put that in the record. So uh, very respectfully, I suggest that we have these people come and, and enter their own testimony as opposed to an interpretation by the chairman. And I would like to, to ask you, um, Dr. Um, Pruitt, have you, have you had any conversations with Dr. Norwood? And, if you've, if, uh, and what is your interpretation to date uh, on their support of the agency's plan? Well, uh, Dr. Norwood is, of course, the chairman of the standing committee now of the National Academy of Sciences that is uh, looking over all of our plans for the accuracy and coverage evaluation as well as the basic census. And so, obviously, I, I, I go to all of their meetings that are publicly open. I'm frequently asked to testify or to present materials before that committee. Uh, so, yes, I've attended every one of the meetings of this, of this committee and have had conversations with, with, uh, with uh, Ms. Norwood in that, in that context. Um, I, I believe that uh, to try to, to, to get the facts exactly on the table, um, the, uh, the letter to which you refer, which is, of course, over a year old, uh, written in May, uh, May 3rd of 1999, was based upon the degree of work that had been done to that date. And there has been a lot more work done on the ACE design since that date. Uh, and that's what is represented by this stack. Uh, that is, the size of the stack about a year ago would have been, uh, you know, a, a quarter to, a, to, a, to a, a fifth of this size, because we hadn't done a lot of the technical work then. And so based upon the technical work that had been done, which is the early design of the sample, uh, this is the judgment that the committee wrote in that letter of May, May 3rd. Uh, I think it's correct to say that the, um, the National Academy Committee has not, quote unquote, signed off on the full design because they haven't met since the full design has been uh, completed. There are now 106 major decisions that have to be made with respect to the uh, ACE design. Uh, 104 of those have been made. The two which have not been made have to do with um, weight trimming methodology in our estimation, the specific criteria for weight trimming methodology, and under variance estimation, we have not fully uh, finished uh, talking through technically the specific criteria for incorporating controlled rounding into generalized variance estimation. Those are the only two out of 106 major decisions that have not yet been completed. Uh, and they are, you know, we're talking about those out there all the time right now. In the next couple of weeks, we will have resolved those. We'll put them in a piece of paper. They will join this stack, and they will be sent to this committee if they want them, and also to the National Academy. So I think it's fair to say they have not, quote unquote, signed off on the final design because no one could have. The final design didn't exist uh, on May 3rd, nor indeed as of yesterday, when, or whenever the chairman talked to, to Ms. Norwood. Um, it did not exist. Um, so I think the National Academy Committee has been extremely useful to us, looking at our work, judging it, passing back suggestions and recommendations to us, holding public events, indeed a major public event on the design uh, uh, earlier this year. Another one scheduled for September. So we don't expect them to have signed off on a design that's not yet been completed. I think the chairman is quite correct. They need to see it. And they will see it as soon as it's completely finished. And we're very close to having it completely finished. Do Dr. Pruitt, a number of people have suggested that the use of statistical methods to correct errors in a census opens the process to political manipulation. Would you please explain to us whether or not you believe that to be true? And what can be done to assure the public that no such uh, manipulation occurs? Well, needless to say, there are a few charges that, 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 um, that bother the Census Bureau as much as, as this one does. Um, to my knowledge, the, um, the decision 
memo by Secretary Mosbacher in 1991 was the first time a senior official of the United States government ever put on record the possibility that the Census Bureau could design a procedure in anticipation of it having a given partisan outcome. And what he said is that um, the political outcome of a choice, that is a statistical procedure, can be known in advance. He says, I'm confident that political considerations played no role in the Census Bureau's choice of an adjustment model for the 1990 census. I am deeply concerned, however, that adjustment could open the door to political tampering with the census in the future. This put on record the idea that the Census Bureau could design something having a known partisan outcome. Uh, let me just say that um, this strikes me as, um, uh, as ludicrous on the face of it. Um, the Census Bureau does not have the competence to determine predetermined partisan outcomes. It has no statistical expertise in reapportionment or redistricting, no expertise on trends in voting behavior. To predetermine partisan outcomes, the Census Bureau would need to bring to bear such expertise when it selected data collection methodologies several years in advance of when the census counts are actually to be used for reapportionment or redistricting. It's simply way beyond the competence or capacity. Even if the Census Bureau intended to do it, it would not know how to do it. It does not have the competence, does not have the interest, and it certainly does not have the professional position that that's what its job is. Um, I would like to um, point out that there are a large number of oversight agencies, this committee, the Congressional Monitoring Board, the Inspector General. There are some several dozen reporters who follow the census very closely. Uh, there are public watchdog organizations. There are National C Academy committees. There are a large number of people who, if they could find partisan manipulation of this census, would be the first to report it. And I can only say we're now getting toward the end of the census, and no such incident has ever been revealed. Where is the evidence that the Census Bureau that the Census Bureau is designing things to have a partisan outcome. What, what kind of capacity would we have to have? We don't have it. We wouldn't know how to do it. We don't care about it. We don't pay any attention to redistricting data, our voter trend data, our who, what governor controls what state. We don't pay any attention to that stuff because we're actually trying to do a census. And that's the kind of capacity we have. Mm -hmm. So I just think the charge that the Census Bureau itself has a partisan agenda should be dismissed I invite the Congress, the Congressional Monitoring Board, to try to determine this and find it and reveal it. I beg the co-chairman to have a hearing simply on this issue, and they have not yet done it. So I just find this charge that's been put in the books 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, there's never been any evidence put on the table. I just wish someone would put the evidence on the table so we could answer it. Um, I'd like to, to ask a, an operational question uh, on, on on a non-ACE uh, topic, uh, you, you stated today that the Bureau had completed 50 percent of the non-response follow-up, and that sounds remarkably good at this point. And are you ahead of schedule, behind schedule? Could you comment on this number and exactly where you are? Um, well, uh, we're always cautious, um, of course. Um, Choosing my words carefully, we're not displeased to be at 50 percent. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the hard cases are yet before us. Uh, we are now running into uh, gated communities, uh, a, a much higher density of gated communities where we're having a very difficult time getting past the doorman, uh, and yet we know we have a low response rate from some of those areas. We're certainly now running into the difficult cases in the inner city in the African-American population that Congressman uh, Davis just referred to. Uh, we're running into the difficult cases in the immigrant populations. So to say that we're 50 percent where we need to be is indeed good news. Uh, and as I say, when you put that together with the mail-out, we're about 85 percent finished with the census. But we're now down to the hard cases. And as I have said in my written testimony, I've said many, many times, at the end of the day, we will not get everyone. Uh, it just, we just would be, we would love to be proven wrong, but we've had too many people already say, I will not answer this, or I don't care what you say, you can put me in jail, I've given you some of that evidence before. So we will not, we will not be able to get everyone into the census. Um, thank you. Mr. Ryan, if you let me uh, make one comment first, and that's uh, um, 
the question is on um, the political manipulation of the census. Uh, I would like to insert in the record the Supreme Court decision uh, concurring uh, that Justice Scalia uh, said, and he used the phrase uh, that a estimation was more likely to be politically manip manipulated than the full court. So, I mean, we do have a then a full count. Uh, we, you know, the Supreme Court's even saying that uh, there is a difference of potential political manipulation. And I also like to include in the record the CRS uh, report uh, on uh, adjustment. And uh, so, because the CRS said, uh, as I said in my statement, that um, um, that basically that uh, the Supreme Court ruling did not preclude the use of it for uh, redistricting. That it, you know, use of money and other things is not is a different issue, but for purposes of redistricting, it did not rule it was not uh, uh, it was illegal. So with that and with the inclusion of those, without objection, I include both those statements. Mr. Ryan, uh, Dr. Pruitt, let me let me start with a couple questions, but then I'd like to get into. I guess we're getting down to this issue now, the politicizing, you know, politicizing this thing. Uh, have you made the final decision to adjust the census numbers according to the results of a, the ACE? that you have made that final decision, correct? No, sir. We, we will not make that decision until, um, uh, oh, February, February, March of okay. 2001. In your written testimony, uh, you indicate that you would not release the adjusted numbers if they did not meet the Bureau's standards of accuracy. And you said in re, uh, a review of the ACE would, quote, should take into consideration a review of selected measures of quality. Uh, specifically, what are those measures of quality? When were they established? Um, yes, sir. That is indeed the topic of our next hearing with the National Academy of Sciences. We're working these through right now. We'll be presenting these publicly uh, well before when, when we make the decision in September. Can I give you one example? Sure. Let us say we get the, the results back from the accuracy and coverage evaluation, and we have a higher than expected undercount in inner cities of the white population which owns its own home. That we don't expect. Well, it may well be since 1990 to 2000, there's been a lot of gentrification, and a lot of this gentrification is now in gated communities, and these people are not returning their questionnaire, and we get an unexpected mm -hmm. undercount in a population group where we didn't expect it. When we get that pattern, what we will do is say, can we explain it? If it's a pattern we can't explain, it'll make us nervous, and we'll have to figure it out. If we can explain it, because there are now more gated communities and inner cities uh, that happen to be owned and, and inhabited by, by uh, uh, whites who normally give us answers to this, we will say, now we have an explanation for something that otherwise looks to be anomalous. So that's what I would mean by looking at, at, at our own results before we, we made the final decision. Okay, and at your request, the National Academy of Sciences can have, have the special panel that has been convened, headed by Janet Nord, which we've been discussing today. Uh, to review this. How, how important do you believe is the task of this panel? And do you know what their timeline is? What is going to be the timeline of the panel for evaluating the, statistic, the statistical me methods? Um, well, uh, we, we think this panel is very important, and our work with the National Academy of Science has been very important over the entire decade. Uh, however, the decision itself about the, uh, what the Census Bureau is obligated to do to fulfill its constitutional and, and, and other statutory obligations is clearly a decision of the Census Bureau, not of any uh, independent uh, uh, committee of the National Academy. Okay, then let me ask you this. Will you wait for the evaluation of the panel before you re release your adjusted numbers? Well, of course not. We have to release our adjusted numbers according to our statutory deadlines. Okay. Well, let's get to the political part of this. I don't know then. when they're going to do their evaluation. That, they're independent of us. Yeah. Let, let me get to the, the, the political part of this. And I, I, I understand your comments where you say this is ridiculous that the, the census could be politicized. Well, I don't see you as a political person. I don't see those who work with you at, at the Census Bureau as political people. I see you as doing a job, and you've done a good job in enumeration. I'd like to you know, give you credit for that. Uh, <clears throat> you're working at, at a statistical adjustment. You're doing what you've been trained to do. But your boss is the President of the United States. Uh, your boss below him is the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, very political people, the head of another political party. So you can understand why you can see these kinds of allegations. I don't think people are saying Ken Pruitt is a, is a politician who is seeking political ends with a statistical adjustment. But you can see, and it's very rational to take a look at the situation and who you work for to then make those conclusions. The concern that I think many people have is the compressed timetable. 
In 1991, the Bureau discovered a computer error in the PES system that threw the undercount off by a million people. Then, during a series of evaluations that took about two years, the Bureau discovered more errors in the plan that added millions of people erroneously. Now, so far in the census, research has shown that the Bureau has had two computer errors. One printed 120 million wrong addresses. The other failed to print millions of surnames. These things happen. But given the 1990 experience, and given that small computer errors produce millions of problems very easily in the adjustment, there is cause for concern. So can you understand that people in Congress and in the scientific community are alarmed at the prospect of making adjusted numbers official after less than four months of evaluation? That's, that's the cause for concern. And the other question I have in that is, are you, are you trying to have the official numbers done by January 20th? Is that a deadline that you're trying to shoot for? You mean the redistricting numbers? The you don't mean the, the apportionment yes, numbers? Yes. Oh, absolutely not, sir. There's no way we can okay. complete the, these numbers. The official by adjusted numbers, then, not just the redistricting numbers. Well, and so if, if, well, I'll let you answer. Certainly, no, I, I think I know where you're going. And so uh, the, there is, of course, the apportionment number, which is December 31, that will be finished on schedule. There is then the redistricting number, uh, which is April 1st. Right. The redistricting number, uh, current plan includes that to be an adjusted number or a corrected number. Um, under no circumstances would our schedule allow us to produce that data no, tape no, I understand prior that. to January 20th. I understand that the official adjustment leads to the, the redistricting numbers. but. Don't you think it's a reasonable concern that given the problems that can occur with an adjustment that a four-month timetable is, is relatively rapid? Oh, yes, sir. In fact, I would say, uh, Congressman Ryan, that trying to get the basic census done in nine months uh, puts a lot of pressure on us. Uh, and indeed, a, a coding error can occur in the enumeration census as well as the corrected uh, sure. process. It could just occur, and the ones that you've just cited occurred in the, uh, in, in the basic census. Um, and indeed, it's quite possible that we will find out two years from now that we made some error. We don't expect to find that in the enumeration. But if so, we would have already reapportioned, uh, and we would have to say, too bad, we made an error, and there it is. So it's not something unique to the ACE process. It's something that's a characteristic of the entire process. Um, we obviously learned a lot based on 1990 and 1980 where we did these, uh, these exercises and we have put in place, and this is what this documentation is all about, uh, we have put in place with respect to our software development work uh, enormous uh, uh, layers of redundancy. We have, double, we have double coded every piece of software in the ACE process. Uh, and then we have compared the results of two completely separate uh, writings of the software code. Uh, and we have built in quality assurance processes. So we know it's a tight time schedule, but so is the census a tight time schedule. Everything in this process is a tight time schedule. Uh, we are very pleased that the errors that have been discovered thus far did not have operational consequences, and they were out of 2,500 different pieces of software, one or two. And the last thing I would want to do is, is force you to do sloppy work by making you compress into an artificially chosen timetable. Let me go back to the fact that the task of the National Academy of Sciences at your request is to evaluate the quality and accuracy of the ACE. Why will you not wait for their review of your data before releasing your official adjusted numbers? Um, because we have a statutory de deadline that says we must reduce release numbers by April 1st. The, the National Academy of Science will take a couple of years. Uh, we always ask the National Academy of Science to evaluate our work. What good is their analysis if you're not going to wait for it? Well, just the way their 1990 analysis helped us plan 2000. Their, their 2000 analysis will help us for two, 2010. It's just the nature of the system. Uh, we, we cannot delegate, we cannot delegate as the Census Bureau the decision about what numbers to give to this country to an independent agency. You wouldn't advise I'm not, us to I'm not do saying that. you're delegating the decision to, a, to an independent agency as to what numbers you give, but if you're asking the scientific community to review your data, to review the accuracy of your data before making them official, uh, you ought to wait for them to review your data before making them official. That's, uh, that's where I think the point can be adequately made under reasonable terms that there could be a politicization of this process. Yes. That's, me... that's the concern. Yeah, fine. If you're not going to wait for the scientific community to look at the data, to look at the accuracy, to make sure things were done correctly, and rush to get these data out, these, these adjusted numbers out there in official capacity, then why bother? Uh, th those questions, I think, are, are serious questions. Uh, I, 
One more question, and I uh, see you're going to answer it. If, <laughs> if you were to release the numbers early, how much kind of warning would, would Congress add when you release the adjusted numbers? If we had released them early, you mean prior to April 1st? Yes. Well, we historically have released um, adjusted numbers on a flow basis. Uh, that is, we re mm -hmm. as soon as we finish a state, we release it. Um, and we have certain states that have higher, faster deadlines than other states with respect to redistricting. Uh, and what we've informed the states is we will get to them as soon as possible. We do not expect to have any state completed before early March. Uh, but I can imagine that we've got some states out as early as March 5th, some other states out March 11th, some other states out. We're going to be driving toward an April 1st deadline. I'm not quite sure what you mean by informing Congress of this. We normally uh, simply release redistricting data tape um, on a flow basis starting as soon as we can. It, it's, I'm happy to tell the Congress when we have that schedule. Well, there's nothing secret about that schedule. That would be appreciated. Sure. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, let me yield for the moment to the ranking member. I, I thank Mr. Davis for his yielding and for his outstanding leadership on this issue. I just wanted to respond to the series of questions that my dear friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Ryan, was putting forth and ask you, um, Dr. Pruitt, Director Pruitt, can we expect from you the same independence and independent judgment and action that we saw in Dr. Barbara Bryant when she opposed former President Bush and Secretary Mossbacker and came out for modern scientific methods because she believed in them. Uh, we have a long history of independence in the census department and in census directors in speaking out for what they think is right for an accurate count for, for, for America. Can we expect the same type of independent action on your part? Um, uh, uh, Congresswoman Maloney, uh, if the Census Bureau looks at the adjusted data, the corrected data, uh, in February, March, and if I am then the director, and we decide that these data have some serious flaw in them, uh, we will simply not release them. Uh, and irrespective of what the President of the United States wants, whoever that may be at that time, uh, irrespective of what the Secretary of Commerce wants, we would recommend. Now, if they make us do it, as they did, uh, as, as Mossbacher overruled Dr. Bryant, I don't know what we do. But certainly the, uh, the Census Bureau would, uh, would not wish to release any data product in which it did not have confidence. Uh, I might say, um, continuing on this line, if I could for a moment, that I believe that in 1980, uh, that the decision about whether to adjust or not was left to Vince Baraba, the then director of the Census Bureau. I think that's the proper level for this decision. Uh, and in 1990, the decision was not left to the professionals at the Census Bureau. Instead, it was made at the Secretary of Commerce. Um, I would strongly urge, strongly urge, that the decision in 2000 be made at the level of the Census Bureau. Totally uh, in, in oblivious about who may be the Secretary of Commerce at that time. Uh, but I believe that this is not a decision that should be made at the level of, 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 of the Commerce Secretary, but should be made at the level of the Census Bureau itself uh, and, and its director. Indeed, we have in place a standing committee that meets every two weeks to go through all of this technical stuff, and it is designed to follow the ACE process very closely, both in terms of its statistical theory, in terms of its operations, and then make a recommend, recommendation to the director as to whether to use it or not. Just if I could continue for a second. Uh, Congressman Ryan, I didn't fully say, I do understand uh, some of the concerns. I, I'm not trying to dismiss the concerns. I'm only trying to say that there's no evidence for those concerns. And I, even if a, a member of the Supreme Court says that it could happen, doesn't mean it could happen. I don't know technically, absolutely, I don't know technically. If you think about it, think about it. You're sitting there trying to generate these data, and you're now saying, in what state is there a redistricting battle in which there's a governor of this party and a legislature of this party, and what are the processes, and what would we have to do to get the data that would... F I mean, if you actually think about it for a moment practically, how in the world would we do it? Are, are we sitting there sort of looking at, at voter turnout in different states? Are we sitting there looking at the balance of power between the legislative and the executive branch in different states? Do we even understand how different states do redistricting? If you actually think about it practically, it's inconceivable that the Census Bureau in that, in that uh, uh, environment of trying to produce good data is going to take on this extra task of finding out what are its likely political implications in a given state. Just, just not in the cards. 
And I don't see how people can think it's in the cards. I don't care if they are on the Supreme Court, sir. I don't know what evidence he has uh, to, to sort of make that accusation. I simply don't know what the basis of that accusation is. Reclaiming my time. Thank you. You know, as I was listening to my friend and colleague from Wisconsin, I was saying to myself as he described the hierarchy or relationship of the executive branch, that there is no way that he would think people with the name Daly and Clinton <laughs> would be seeing this. <laughs> This in a political way. <laughs> of no, never, course. never. <laughs> they wouldn't, <laughs> by no stretch of the imagination. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, um, let me try and make sure that I understand some of the technical language. Uh, it's my understanding that, that captured probability does not necessarily mean that everybody in a category are the same, but there are enough similarities that in terms of the probability of them being counted or enumerated becomes essentially the same. Exactly is, is, correct, sir. And, and, and so we are, yes, sir. they don't have to have all of the same characteristics, but there are enough factors. Yeah. They are certainly not clones of each other, as was suggested. Uh, 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 they, they, well, we have done a lot of research for 40 or 50 years on this, and what we do is we say, what are the probabilities that we will include in the census people with this set of characteristics? That's all it says. It doesn't say they're alike in all other ways. It's just how similar are they with respect to the probability of catch, catching them in the census? In statistical language, is, is there a difference between correctness and accurateness? Yes, sir. Um, accuracy really has to do with the truth. And uh, all statistical operations are estimations of the truth. That is true of the basic census. There is a true number of people who lived in the United States on April 1st. Our census is an estimation of that. Um, we use the ACE to get closer to estimating that truth. Accuracy would be if we actually found and counted every one of them. We will never be able to do that for you. We believe we will get you closer to the truth by using this process, or we wouldn't be doing it. Why else would we do it? We got lots of things to do. We only do statistical procedures because they think, they, we, we believe they get us closer to the truth. But so accuracy has to do with how close to the truth can we get. And so the closest that you could possibly get would be through the use of corrected data. Is that accurate? We believe so. <laughs> and, and so it becomes almost, I mean, if we, we, we're, we're trying to get as close as we can. Yes, sir. To making sure that every person in the country is indeed accounted for. Yes, sir. And so without using the corrected data, we would obviously then just say to ourselves, that we're going to leave those individuals out. Uh, Mr. Davis, I could answer that as follows. Let us say that in 2000, we were not doing an accuracy and coverage evaluation. We were simply doing the basic count and then stopping. And then we came up with a number, 275,311,000 or whatever. It would be my judgment that a more accurate number to give to the country would be that number plus 1.6 percent, which is to say I would still rather use the 1990 estimate of the undercount, uh, even for the 2000 data, if we were not doing an accuracy and coverage evaluation, I would be convinced that that number we counted plus 1.6 percent would be a more accurate number than simply stopping with the basic count. We will do better because the accuracy and coverage evaluation that we have in place for 2000 is a much better tool to use than one from 1990. But even the one from 1990 would give us a more accurate count, one that was closer to the truth than simply stopping with the basic enumeration. I know that, 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 that we've talked a great deal about the enumeration, and there is a cutoff period. There's a time when we expect to have this done. Should we continue to experience difficulty 
in some areas. Will that cutoff date be adhered to, or is there any way to continue up to a point of satisfaction? Uh, we will certainly continue, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, we, we expect across 520 offices to have completed most of our work in most of them uh, by our cutoff date, which is July 7th. But that's not a cutoff date. That's a date in our master at, uh, activity schedule. But certainly, as was true in 1990, and in all censuses, there are always some local offices where we have not fully exhausted all of our procedures. And we will continue in those areas until we've exhausted all of our procedures, until we cannot think that going back yet again is likely to give a, a response to that household. And so one can expect that, that, that every effort or maximum effort will be made to make sure that we even reach those individuals that we're having difficulty with. Yes, sir. But at a certain point, uh, we, we know that we're simply wasting taxpayer dollars. And so at a certain point, we're better off not, you know, at, at how many times do you want to go back and knock on the door where nobody ever answers? And when the person who answers said, I don't care what you say to me, I'm not going to give you that information. We can send that person back four times, six times, 27 times. At a and in some point, instances, I guess it, it, it would remind me, if you just keep doing it, of, of, you know, a young woman met a soldier and wanted to get married, and she says, soldier, soldier, would you marry me? with your fife and drum, and he says, no, pretty miss, I can't marry you. I don't have any shoes. So she ran and got him some shoes. Came back, same thing, with you marry me with your fife and drum. He says, no, pretty miss, I can't marry you. I don't have a tuxedo to put on. So she ran and got the tuxedo, came back, and soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your fife and drum? Finally, he says, no, pretty miss, I can't marry you because I got a pretty little wife at home. <laughs> and, and, and so it seems to me that you're saying at some point, people are going to say, get away from my door. Just don't come back yes, sir. anymore. I mean, those individuals who, who are inclined to do so. Yes, sir. Let me ask you, of course, there's been a lot of conversation about my city, the city of the big shoulders, uh, the city of Chicago in terms of, of, of difficulty that we're having. Could, could you elaborate on what's going on there and, and, and what we're doing? Uh, yes, sir. And I, uh, Congressman Ryan will also be interested, of course, because it's not just the city of Chicago, but the Chicago region. Uh, I do want to say that the Chicago region, um, as a region, is actually in, in fairly good shape. Um, it's not our strongest region, but it's certainly not our weakest region. Indeed, when you take into account both the mailback response rate and the completion of the non-response follow-up workload, the Chicago region is roughly in the middle uh, right now. And since the whole scale is high right now, that means we're in good shape, even at the very worst region, we're actually in good shape. Now, with respect to the city itself, uh, I believe there are um, uh, now four local census offices where we believe that we have had to improve the strength of our local management, and we have done so. Uh, in some instances, we've actually changed the local manager. In other instances, we've brought in additional management uh, uh, help. Sometimes what happens, Congressman uh, Davis, is that um, there's more work going on than the, the system records because stuff just stacks up and somebody doesn't know you got to process stuff every six hours to get it and so forth and so on. We're finding that out. That may not be an explanation, but that may be part of the explanation in Chicago. I certainly think that we are running in Chicago into deep resistance to cooperating with the census. Uh, and that's actually happening at both ends of the economic scale. Uh, we are running into very difficult times in the, um, in the near north, in gated communities. These are people who are very busy. They're, you know, worrying about their stock market returns and so forth. They didn't send the return in. And now we're having a hard time getting past the, um, the doormen who guard these buildings. Uh, and it's extremely difficult. Um, on the other hand, what we do is we do special things. Uh, we go to the building manager. If that doesn't work, we go to the owner of the building. If not, we sometimes go to somebody influential in the city, try to get them to make that call. Um, and then at the other end of the economic scale, as you well know, the poverty people that you mentioned in your own district, those are very resistant, very resistant people. They're disconnected from the society. They're indifferent to their um, obligations. They do not feel the U.S. government or the local government cares about them. And why in the world should they cooperate with this? 
That's why we do an accuracy and coverage evaluation. We're doing one quarter of one percent of the households. When you're doing one quarter of one percent of the gated communities with your very best people, you have a higher probability of getting in than when you're trying to do the entire universe of gated communities. It's the same thing with the, with the um, young African-American male in the Robert Taylor home. It's very difficult to get them all. On the other hand, when you're doing one quarter of one percent of them with your very best enumerators, the probability has just gone way up that you will get them. And that's what we do in order to calculate the undercount. Let me ask, after this is all over, uh, does the Bureau have sociologists and researchers and, and people who will try and study the situation and make some determinations relative to this deep resistance that, that, that you spoke of? Yes, sir. Um, yes, we do. We did after 1990. We had anthropologists and sociologists trying to help us understand these population groups. And finally, um, you know, I, I think it would certainly be good, and I understand that you're trying to make a trip out to Chicago to um, give whatever additional assurances to the elected officials and, and, and the citizens there that every effort is in fact being made to overcome the deep resistance that, that we might be experiencing. And I'd certainly look forward to Thank you, sir. that happening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Um, Mr. Director, let me um, follow up one more point on uh, what I was asking earlier about the uh, um, the uh, uh, broad classifications we're using. And I would like to enter the record a letter I received from Dr. Friedman, uh, who's head of the statistics department at Berkeley, University of California. And this is the, uh, he said, let me read some, for example, it is assumed that all non-Hispanic Asians age 0 to 17 living in rental units are equally likely, likely to be undercounted from the suburbs of Honolulu to Chinatown in New York. This assumption is plainly false. And uh, they've done studies to show that uh, there are huge variations within post data across states. And so there's a real concerns about that. As, I mean, you're very aware of that uh, concern. Let me now switch to the issue again of transparency and uh, with respect to the ACE. Um, you, you've it made your, indicated your intention to make the census fully transparent and free from charges of political manipulation. Will you commit to releasing the e-sample and p-sample files from the ACE for analysis by the academic and scientific community as soon as they are available to the Bureau? They are not confidential files, and for the 1990, they were not made available until 1998. Yes, I, I don't know the 1990 to 1998 process, but, but certainly they will be made available, yes, sir. Now, there is a real concern about the decision process of which is going to be the more accurate set of data. And, you know, uh, and uh, if the National Academy of Sciences is not going to be able to make a decision prior to March of uh, 2001, um, who's going to make that decision? Now, my understanding in 1991, when this decision was made, um, that there was a panel within the Bureau of Experts uh, that was basically equally divided uh, to help. Maybe I'm not, sh you know, maybe more clarification, but there was some panel of experts within the Bureau, but you're not going to rely on the National Academy of Sciences because they're going to take too long, I gather. Well, yes, sir. We couldn't wait. The National Academy of Sciences uh, will, will do evaluations. There's already a 2010. So National how's the Academy decision going to be made? Is it going to be, be just made, well, of course, you won't be there, or, or unless whoever's appointed president. I mean, it's all likely. We know there's going to be a new president. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Hogan will still certainly be there. I mean, you know, who's going to, you know, Yes. What um, experts? Are they strictly s bureau employees, or who's going to come up with yes. the recommendations? I think there were some outside recommend people making recommendations, acknowledged experts. Yeah, no, what, what, uh, what will occur, let's just talk about 2000. Uh, what will occur in 2000, and is occurring in 2000, we do have an executive committee that uh, follows the ACE process. As I say, it meets every two or three weeks, many members of which are right here behind me. Uh, I think there may be nine, uh, nine, Nine, oh no, it's larger than that, maybe 13 uh, members of that, who represent all, all Census Bureau employees who are mass statisticians, demographers, uh, 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 field operations expertise, and so forth. Um, and they look at every one of these processes, every one of these processes, and, and make a judgment and deliberation about what will make the most successful census. Uh, they will continue to meet right through the entire process. Uh, the way they are designed, that, that committee is chaired by John Thompson, and it's advisory to the director. Uh, it will make a recommendation to the director. 
That's um, the process. Yeah. One of the concerns I've had goes back a couple years or so is you can have a bias within a, a committee. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if I select a committee or Ms. Maloney selects a committee, I mean, it would have a, you know, if we have sole responsibility to select it, it can have a bias by who we select. <laughs> I mean, you ask Mr. Davis and Ms. Maloney, they're going to have one set of opinions, Mr. Ryan and I have not. So, how, you know, my understanding there was a, a more of a nonpartisan. I mean, you know, if you select all people that are already biased in favor of adjustment, you're going to have that type of conclusion. And I'm sure Mr. Hogan, who's a, uh, who's a respected statistician and all, I'm not, has got his, you know, I mean, oh. Oh. bias to some extent. Yes. Yes. Because yes. he's, you know, got his heart and soul into this for a decade. He's been working on this uh, program. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Fried, Dr. Friedman at University of California, Berkeley, who's not going to have any input in it, is a respected statistician too but uh, so um, I mean are you you know are the only people going to provide input just people that are going to be yes people uh, no sir okay I don't know quite what you mean by yes people they're they're um, I don't consider Mr. Hogan a yes person no uh, you, yeah you wouldn't if you met with him on the day <laughs> um, and uh, uh, these are these are professionals I want to make sure there's divergent opinions Enter, well, enter, enter the decision you, process. If, if, if you sat and listened to some of the arguments that go into this, you would appreciate there's a divergence of opinion. Um, and, and it certainly includes people who in 1990 thought we should not uh, uh, have adjusted, as a matter of fact, who are, who are employees and, and very senior and important employees uh, at the Census Bureau. This is not a committee that was sort of put together that way. It's a committee all of whom have defined positions. These are the senior positions. And so they're there by virtue of the position they hold, not not the uh, kind of uh, assumption they have. We didn't test anybody's viewpoint about... But there's uh, no outsiders in participating no, in this. No. The, the, but there the, was in 1990s, my understanding. No, there was no, not. Uh, that's conference. a different process. I can describe that. Right. That's a different process. Well, um, I'd be interested to, some, to have some explanation of how the process Certainly. and the decision Certainly. be made. We can provide Let me that, uh, yeah. switch another question. In your written testimony, you say you will use something called dual system estimation to estimate the degree to which each of the 448 categories of post data is overcounted and or undercounted. Then you would assign a certain weight to that category, which would tell you how many people to add or subtract from that particular segment of the population. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. I don't think that's exactly my wording. I don't think I okay. talked about, I have to look it up, but I think it talks but, about statistical records. Uh, let me, let me not, proceed. Not, not people, right. right. It, if it is possible to have straighted with adjustment factors of more than one, and you'll have an adjustment factor, as you said, maybe 1.1, 1 1.2, it is also possible to have post data with adjustment factors of less than one. That is, people fitting a certain description could be multiplied by a factor of 0.8 or 0.9. Correct. Correct. Okay. Let's take an example. Let's say you're talking about the following. A non-Hispanic white woman ages 30 to 49 living in the suburbs who own their own homes in the Midwest. Let's say the Bureau estimates a 5% overcount of these women. The Bureau would give this group an adjustment factor of 0.95. So if the unadjusted census count, counted 100 people, 100 women in their block, the adjusted number would show only 95 in that block. The truth is if the actual census counts 100 people in a block, but in the ACE, all these people fall into a category that the Bureau estimates were overcounted, the adjusted population for the block would be less than 100. So we, we are, in effect, deleting people from no, the sir. census. No, we're not I mean, if we have 100 the people and their adjustment factor is 0.95, we're only going to have 90 point, 95 people counted, no? Well, I, I appreciate, I, I will honestly answer I know we're not going to destroy forms. We're not talking about the forms okay, being well, there. The, but the fact is... Well, it's very, very important to make the, the American public understand that 72 years from now, when you and I go together to the National Archives, uh, <laughs> uh, everyone who submitted a form right. uh, will be. find their record there, and there will be no form there from anyone who did not submit a form. That is, the actual census file itself will include everyone who cooperated in this census. Uh, now, we are now talking about a statistical record, right. and that's a different process. So it's not anything about people kind of being subtracted or virtual people or anything else. We're talking about a statistical process. The answer, sir, is yes. Where we have evidence that a certain population group was double counted, then to leave them in the statistical record that is to leave records for those people in the statistical record, means that we have now inflated some number. We're now giving to the country something which we know to be incorrect, and we don't think we should do that. So, I mean, we're not, if, if we don't, if two people, you know, complete the form, one in Florida and one in New York, I mean, the same person, we, you know, we don't want that, we, you know, I understand that. But the problem is, my understanding is, that if you have 100 people living in her, you know, apartment, high-rise or something, probably. Uh, 
And if that is a statistical classification that is considered overcounted, you're, you have 100 people you count. We have a, a 100 forms that are returned. All right, and you've got 100 people listed by name. Mm -hmm. But then because that fit into a classification that's considered overcounted, you're gonna subtract people from that, and so the actual count, instead of being 100 people in that building, would be 98 or whatever adjustment number, right? Yes, sir. O otherwise, we would be giving the country incorrect data. Well, then you're deleting people from the census. No, we're not deleting people from well, the census. Well, wait a minute. I mean, we're, we're keeping the forms. I understand the okay. forms are gonna be there, or I'm not sure they're physically gonna be kept. I know that yeah. that's a different issue. But, uh, I mean, you're, we're gonna count less, people can get counted as less than a 1.0. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be counted as a 0.98, yeah. a 0.95. Yeah. You, we, you're going to have fewer people. If you have 100 people that fill out that form, I mean the yeah. forms, you have 100 people, 100 names in that area, mm -hmm. and it comes out with a 0.98 adjustment factor because of the statistical analysis, then you're only going to have the number that's going to show up in the adjusted, or you like to call it corrected, uh, the adjusted number is 0.98, is 98 people. You'll be two fewer people. H happy to call it adjusted. Um, uh, you're, again, if I could just take a moment, um, the people that you are describing, that is the category of persons that you're describing, we have independent evidence that those kinds of persons were double counted at the rate of, of 0.02 percent, to use your example. And therefore, to leave statistical records in of that category at the level of which uh, uh, you are recommending that we do means that basically we are deliberately leaving in the census counts people who have been double counted because they counted their college student and we found their college student at the dormitory. That happens. And what we know from 1990 is as many as four million cases. So yes, we have a statistical procedure that for the purposes of giving this country accurate data for reapportionment, for redistricting, for federal funding. We have a process that does not give the country incorrect data when we know it's incorrect. Nothing more complicated than that. But if you have 100 names in this area, in this block, and your statistical analysis says that's an overcounted population, so even though you have 100 names of 100 separate individuals, you're going to statistically remove two, three, four, whatever number of people of that overjudged. And this is one of the problems about all these uh, post-strata. I mean, it's kind of like the issue, as Dr. Freeman talks about, you know, your claim that you're getting these numbers from Asians in Hawaii and uh, Asians in Chinatown are the same. They have the same response rate. I mean, some studies <laughs> show that they don't behave the same. And, you know, I guess you've got proof that shows that the Cubans in Miami respond at the same rate of response as the, the Mexicans in Los Angeles or in El Paso or somewhere. I mean, you're saying they're exactly the same behavior. And b based on that, you can delete people or add people, which is hard to say that, you know, I've not been to Los that, Angeles. That's your characterization, not ours, sir. But aren't you using, well, you've already said you're using all Hispanics are one classification. I mean, whether you're a Hispanic in El Paso or Houston or New York City or Chicago or uh, Wisconsin, you get counted the same and you get adjusted the same if you're Hispanic. Didn't quite say that. I said well, that. But aren't well, all Hispanics no. are one category, period. Uh, no. No? Okay. Uh, all Hispanics who also are in census tracts with low response rates, who also rent their houses, uh, who also are between the ages of 18 and 36, who also are women, who also are uh, unrelated to anyone else in that household, all of those people who have that set of characteristics constitute a universe of those people. And then we take a sample of those persons, and on the basis of that sample, estimate for that universe of people who have all of those characteristics, not just Hispanic, but all of those characteristics, what are the probabilities that they were caught in the census? And on the, that's, that's the process that we use. It's yeah. not all Hispanics, because we're not just, we're all, it's like saying all renters are all people between ages of 18 and 34, or all anything else. Post That's not how it for works. Hispanics is all Hispanics, whether, they're, again, they're in El Paso or Chicago or uh, Miami, they're all the same, whether no, Guatemala or well, I, I, I just have to say this again. They are not all the same. Well, you're uh, statistically, no, you're putting them in one no, classification. No, now, let me ask another question. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> if when you take someone, subtract someone from the record, is you subtract them, but you don't have, it's not because of a duplicate, it's just that some statistical model says subtract one person. Is that? Um, 
Oh, wait. I'm when, sorry. When, you, when we subtract, when we have 100 people in a block and your statistical model says subtract somebody, it's not because they're subtracted because you have a duplicate. It's because you've got 100 specific names there, but it's because of the statistical model. It's not because of a duplicate, right? It's oh, just, that's a separate process. All right. Subtracting duplicates is a separate process. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and finish what you were last thing yeah. going to say. I'm sorry. Well, I just do want to keep going back to this. We don't treat all Hispanics like all other Hispanics. We treat Hispanics who rent, who are of a certain age, of a certain gender, uh, of a certain relationship with the household. That's the post-stratum. Not all Hispanics. They all have to live in a metropolitan area. So it's, it's simply incorrect to say that all Hispanics belong to the same post-stratum. Right. But the Hispanics that meet those classifications can be living in Los Angeles, El Paso, Houston, Miami, or New York, or Chicago, as long as they meet those general classification, then th they're all adjusted. So just as Dr. Walker, I mean, the, you know, Asians in, my, in uh, Honolulu are being pooled with the ones in New York, and you're saying they respond the same. Um, let me let's see. I had a, a maybe I should. Um, okay, but let me uh, go on, Ms. Maloney. Mm -hmm. Or I think it's. it's yeah. Does it come this way now? No. Second round. Yeah. Second round will go, okay. Ms. Maloney. Then you. <laughs> uh -huh. Dr. Pruitt, would you uh, please answer? Chairman Miller's line of questioning without interruption. I'd like to give you an opportunity to explain the process without interruption. Uh, well, I think the particular process we're talking about is, this, is the structuring of the post strata, uh, which, as he said, there are 448. Um, these constitute um, identifications of population groups. And one of the identifying characteristics is their ethnicity or their race. It's only one of their identifying characteristics. Another is whether it's a metropolitan area or not, the size of the metropolitan area. Uh, another is, as I say, age, renter status, and so forth and so on. That constitutes a post-stratum. Um, and it is our judgment that everyone who inhabits that post-stratum has a more similar probability of being captured in the uh, census than someone in a different post-stratum. Everyone in the country is put into a post-stratum. You are. You're put in as a white female between 20 and 27. And uh, <laughs> Why is everyone laughing? <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, um, and, and, and we have, uh, based on our, our experience, we have an assessment of the probability of having caught you in the, in the census. Uh, and that's true for all of these groups. Nothing more complicated than that. That's why they're put together. We don't yet know. We don't yet know until we actually conduct the census, how many of them we actually did catch in the census. But we think they constitute a reasonable, plausible universe of people who have roughly similar uh, probabilities of being captured. I've not had the chance to read uh, Mr. Friedman and Mr. Walker's letter. Uh, if they are saying that all agents from every place are put in one post data, they are misreading our post data design. They're very uh, sophisticated statisticians, and I doubt they're misreading it. I doubt that the way you've characterized their letters, the way they've read it, written it, but I haven't read it yet. Um, but my guess is they understand our post data uh, 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 structure, and it's not putting all Asians in one post data. It's just not. Man, I, just, I mean, it's, it's all Asians that meet these, you know, the, the large metropolitan areas and age brackets and such, too. But it's correct that a, a Japanese American in Honolulu that meets that you know, other demographic characteristics, yes. and a China person, a person from China, yeah, but, from but New the, York, that meets that classification, a large metropolitan area, age brackets. That's, that's uh, true. M uh, Mr. Miller, it's, it's just as, uh, there are lots of ways to rent a home. You can rent a condo, you can rent a co-op, you can rent a mobile home, you can rent different kinds of homes. So all renters are also put in a post-stratum because that's one of our stratification variables. Now, it's just not that all renters constitute a post-stratum. It's that all renters that also have all these other characteristics create one. So there's nothing magic uh, about this process to say that there are a lot of different ways in which people rent. But nevertheless, we have decided that renters, on balance, behave differently from owners. And we have a lot of evidence to that effect. So, uh, Dr. Pruitt, uh, approximately how many post-strata of the 448 include the Hispanic characteristics? <laughs> Approximately. We're getting a combination of permutations here. 56. 56, okay. I, I, I think this whole issue of the undercount and, and the 
deep resistance that my colleague Danny Davis uh, illustrated with the, the poem, the time that it was um, clarified to me in a, the, the most stark way were the statements of a Republican appointed member of the Supreme Court, Justice Stevens, when he asked the question of the Republican lawyer, and this was before the case that we've referred to before the Supreme Court, and he asked her, how would you count a home, an address, where six people lived, yet every time you went and knocked on that door, whether it was in the morning or at night or whatever time, no one answered the door. And she said, zero. We would count it zero. Then he asked, what if you knew and all the neighbors told you that six people lived there? She said, we would count it zero. Then Justice Breyer asked, what if the lights go on off and on every night? And you see the lights going off and on every night, and you know people live in that home. How would you count that home? And she said, zero. And that really clarified in the starkest and really simplest of terms why we need to adjust for the undercount when we know the people live there, when we know the people are there, we are being dishonest and unfair and unjust not to count the six people that we know live there. And on the count and the, and the, the issue well, of the, may, may, may I continue? May I continue? Yeah, I, have, yeah. I do not believe I've interrupted you. Okay. May I continue? Yes. And on the issue of the, the double count, many of my friends, because I am a mother, happen to be the parents of my daughters. And I can't tell you, and my daughter is in college. I did not count her. She is going to be counted at her university. But I can't tell you how many of my friends who have similar children my daughter's age at school either told me that they counted their child or literally called and asked me whether or not, because they know I'm working on the census, whether or not they should count their child. So I'm giving these as just practical uh, examples of why we need this. Now I, I have a question that uh, Dr. Pruitt, you mentioned that you would use the 1.6% um, if you had to, but you also said that, uh, that the tool that you had for the 2000 census was a better tool than 1990. And could you explain to us why it is better? Um, well, obviously, we've drawn on our experience from 1990. Uh, we also have a, a, a sample approximately twice the size of what we had in 1990. That was 150,000. Turned out finally to be 170,000 households. Uh, and in, in 2000, it'll be 314,000 uh, households. Uh, we do think the construction of our post straight is dependent, is drawn upon research of over 10 years, that uh, all of our matching procedures, how we're handling movers, uh, our software um, uh, development work, uh, there's no end of, of ways in which we try to improve, but that's true uh, of every census. Uh, 1990 was better than 1980, but uh, 2000 is much, much superior operationally, just like the census itself is superior operationally to the uh, 1990 census, thanks to the U.S. Congress that they allowed us to front load our uh, recruitment staff. That's why we can say that we're near 85 percent complete today. Um, so a lot of the, uh, the improvements that we put into the census, we've also gone and put in improvements to our ACE design. I just... Um, it's for a moment, if I could refer us all to this, I've, I've brought this chart before because I think it's, it's important. Um, each of those peach boxes represent uh, the moments in the census when we can miss people. But it also represents the moments in the census when we can uh, erroneously enumerate, that is double count, such as the college students. So all the ACE is nothing more complicated than this. All it is is to go to try to find those persons who who returned to form but didn't completely mail it back in. They left some people off. It's the people who, for whom we never got an address. We think there won't be many of those, but there are some. 
It's the people who we got in non-response follow-up, but we didn't get the complete household. And it's the people we got in yet another process called uh, coverage improvement follow-up. All of those are processes trying to get everyone. Every one of those processes can leave someone out. And all the ACE is, is a way to go back and find out the, the percentage of people in those various boxes, when we miss them, how we miss them, and what their demographic characteristics are. It's not a very complicated thing. It's a very straightforward thing. And, uh, and if it works operationally, we think that we should give to the country uh, the, the, the better data, the adjusted data, the more, more accurate data, the more corrected data. Uh, uh, that's all I can really say about it is it's an attempt to sort of find the people we missed or to find the people we erroneously included, that is the double count, and make certain they're not represented in the final statistical records. Thank you very much. Mr. Ryan, if I'm, I just want to ask you to clarify one thing. Ms. Maloney, I think, knows the, the answer to this, but when this, that, uh, lawyer spoke about not counting someone if the lights come on and off. That's not the way the Bureau would handle that. I mean, is that correct? In that particular instance, we would try to get a proxy interview. Correct. You'd get proxy data and you'd, hopefully you could find somebody that would know who lives in there and it would not necessarily be zero. You'd try to do everything you can to get some type of data from someone else nearby that, correct. Oh, oh, like a neighbor or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. So I think the attorney was not yeah, as clear on the, on the procedures as your process would show. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, th th that's correct. There were many things about that Supreme Court ruling which were not accurate to, to our procedures. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ryan. I have a couple um, procedural questions. You know, it's not always the inner city that, that we, have to, we have to focus on the rural areas, too. Uh, so I'd like to just put a word in for Orfordville, Wisconsin, if I might. Uh, <laughs> Orfordville is a town of about 700 people. Hopefully it will be a town of 700 people after the census is done. But, but the interesting thing about Orfordville is they all have post office boxes. That's just the way it, w it works there. They all use P.O. boxes. So when they didn't get the forms, they were very much alarmed. I think we followed up with your Chicago office, and I think we're doing a good job of getting some numerators over there to handle that situation. But what about the other Orfordvilles throughout America? small farming towns at the, at, at the intersections of, of rural county trunk highways. My question is, if we didn't intervene in the Orfordville situation and there's other towns like that who have P.O. boxes, who, because we don't have post-census local review, didn't catch that, and these are not included in the master address file, how do we catch these mistakes? Can the adjustment help a neighborhood where no people are counted, essentially. Well, uh, yes, sir, though, before I get to, to, to that question, um, we do have procedures to find those areas where there was this, uh, where, where we thought it was city style, but in sure. it turned out to be And I realize, style. and we're working Across on that right now. Yes, exactly. But, but it's, what if it doesn't work? But, but absolutely. If, oh, absolutely. We would find this in the, in the ACE, and here's how we would find it. Okay. Since the ACE is a random sample of all blocks uh, in the United States, uh, as I say, about 12,000 blocks are in the ACE design, one of those blocks or some set of those 12,000 blocks will be exactly those areas by definition and proportionate to how many such areas they are. When we go to that area in the, uh, in the ACE interviewing process, we'll knock on the door, they'll say, I never got counted, I got left out. We will then determine how could that have happened, and we will then detect exactly that problem. Indeed, it will show up because our address file won't work. We will have independently listed, as I say, we've independently listed every address in our ACE sample block. And we now are saying, my goodness, something's going wrong, because we have a listing of this household but it's not in our master address file. How could have that happened? And then we will determine how that happened, and when we do the adjustment, we will be able to adjust for exactly those population groups who, who these, they, they fit into this top upper right uh, peach box. I can't see that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I've got a copy, but uh, 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 this is missed housing units. And our ACE design is as focused on making sure that we ac account for missed housing units as missed people in known housing units. Okay. I'm going to go back to this Orfordville example because I think it's an interesting one. It, not only do they all use mostly P.O. boxes, but let's take Footville, which is the town just up the road. Footville, for some reason, your master address file, um, even though the LUCA tried to change this, it was the change was not incorporated, you included... Uh, everybody who lived in Footville, Wisconsin, a town of, of about 600, as if they were Janesville, Wisconsin residents. So 
the names were correct. The addresses, however, uh, the street addresses were right, but the cities were, were the larger city in that county. So, and they all had PO boxes. So when the enumerators came around uh, to, to collect the data, they knocked on the door. The people would say, you know, I never got a form. I was never counted. I was worried that you wouldn't come by. Glad you're here. The enumerator then um, had a Janesville address. Now, it's up to the, the person who answered the door to change that address, I assume, to, from Janesville to Footville. But what if that didn't take place? What if an enumerator didn't make it to the house that was a P.O. box and the address uh, for the entire small town um, was, was lumped into another city and those people weren't counted? That means in a town of, say, 600 people, you miss 200 people. That's, that's you know, a third of the city of the town. How does, how does the adjustment fix that? Yeah. Uh, I, I want to make certain that we give you a, a full answer to this. And so what I'm saying may not be uh, a, a completely um, um, responsive. Um, it, it's my understanding that what would happen, and look, the important thing is the addresses are all geocoded, which means whatever the kind of the denominator is, what, what this, what football is called, uh, foot, shoot, Footville. Footville yeah. is called Jane's. Janesville. Janesville. Yeah. Um, that, that the important thing is to make sure that when we count the person in that household, they occur on the block. See, from the census point of view, the name of the, the community is not what's important. The, the unit of analysis for us is the block. And they will be geocoded to that block. So they will appear in the right place. Um, now, the process by which we make sure that all of our blocks uh, get attached to the right they will be at the right place, but now we've got to make sure right. they connect to the right denominator. Exactly. Um, and no, that wouldn't be a problem of the adjustment. That would be a problem of our geographic division working with the local community. It would, it would be easy to fix because we know where they are. Okay, I see my time running out. Um, um, you mentioned in my earlier questioning that, that you're, you're going to be giving the states uh, the redistricting numbers kind of on a state-by-state on a -state basis, starting maybe March 5th and then moving out. Um, but you're... Your post strata uh, adjustment is based on a national scale, correct? Yes, sir. So how how do you how do you how do you take that into consideration as you are as you are releasing state redistricting data on a state by state basis when your post strata mm. is national? How does that jive or correspond with say you put Vermont's out in March and then you put Wisconsin's out in April, then California's out in later April? How does that correspond and how does that take into account the fact that the post trade is national but you're setting out Certainly. individual no. states earlier yeah. um, no I, I all of the all of the work that will have been used to create the correction numbers on a national basis will have already been done uh, across all 50 states in Puerto Rico um, and the the actual mechanical process of actually now creating the right products takes a while. It takes a couple of days or whatever. I better be careful. They'll have to correct me. But anyway, it takes a period of time. And so we will simply turn first to those states which have earlier redistricting deadlines as best we can. I should say the entire, I, I'm not making a promise about March 5th. I'm only saying that in, in principle, uh, it'll be a flow basis. Um, and that was try to respond to your question about uh, Jan 20th. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but basically, we could wait until the last day of the month. March 31st to mail them all out the same day. But I think as a courtesy to the states, we will want to get them out where we can get them out as uh, sooner where, where possible. But all of the work that has to be done in terms of making the correction numbers from the post stratum will have already been done. Otherwise, you're, you're, the implication of your question is correct. And then we couldn't do one state and then so forth. Okay, one, one, one more quick one. Um, the apportionment data, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong in my interpretation, the apportionment data will be done before the ACE adjustment is completed, correct? Correct. How how do we take into consideration Orfordville and Footville, Wisconsin, um, if, if the apportionment data is done before the adjustment and if those towns aren't fixed and counted for, will they not be lost in apportionment but may be caught up in redistricting, but won't they be lost in apportionment if, if they're not fixed with the adjustment beforehand? Uh, not, not if they're in Wisconsin. Um, that is, the apportionment number is nothing but a state total. And we You're have saying not because it's just the block, but, but what if the P.O. box is, what if a numerator didn't hit the door and no one got, got answered? Oh, no. If, 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 if they're not uh, captured in the, in the census and we have not done the ACE, then the Wisconsin number will be deficient by that amount. Right. And because we have a lot of reports about rural areas who are subsisting mainly off P.O. boxes, and if the enumerators just don't catch them, you know, we're planting right now in Wisconsin. People are out in the field. They're not 
in their homes right now. Wouldn't post-census local review make sense? Wouldn't a, a one-month post-census local review let the county clerks, let the local um, county board supervisors take a look at the data and say, gosh, you know, you missed half the town of Orfordville because during the time you were coming around with the enumerators, they were out in the field planting. Uh, wouldn't post-census local review make sense for these cases? And these cases, I, 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 I appeal to you, are not unique. They're, they're all over the place. No. Um, right. Our governor, Tommy Thompson, is saying he's getting it from the entire state of Wisconsin. Right. So um, why wouldn't we want to do post-census local review well, for those kinds of instances? Uh, obviously, a, a post-census local review would have to be done for 39,000 jurisdictions, not just for the, sure. the state. Yep. Yeah. Which means you're asking us to redo the census starting sometime in October, November. That's impractical. Uh, if you want an apportionment number by December 31st, we can't start redoing the census based upon 39,000 different mayors or county commissioners saying we would like you to come back and count again because we don't think everybody got included. What about a voluntary post-census local review like Luca was? Uh, this gets into a very complicated thing having to do with the, the nature of distributive accuracy and numeric accuracy. Um, and it's really what the court case went to and so forth. And I, I can get into this if we have time. But any kind of voluntary process like that that was kind of used some places not other places would have all kinds of at this late stage in the census have all kinds of implications for the final quality of, of the data um, I can't imagine that if we made this uh, voluntary that the only state that would be interested would be Wisconsin uh, I, I think every state in the country would say come back and count us again we may find a few more people that's what the ACE does uh, Congressman Ryan I'm not trying to no. really but you are making a case for the ACE you are making a case for why we have to do this quality process to go out and determine if we miss people, where they live, and then correct for that. Actually, I'm making a case for post-census local review for per apportionment and everything else because LUCA was designed to fix this. Uh, it didn't fix it, though, in some of these towns. Some of these towns did participate in LUCA, did send their data, and they still we still have the problems. Okay. So that's why I'm saying why not exhaust every effort possible um, I still contend that there, there may be a chance, there may be a small timeline, a small window to do a voluntary post-census local review for the, so these rural towns who are having these problems can make sure they're counted. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety out there over this, and I just appeal to you to, to take a look um, at that. We have a vote coming up, but we have time for Mr. Davis. I, actually, I'm glad, Mr. Ryan, that you're on this panel because rural area, as we all know, has problems of their own, and we keep focused on uh, large metropolitan areas and uh, the migrant population, immigrant population as, as problems, but there are unique problems in rural America, and so I'm glad you can bring them up. And I agree with you, by the way, that it's too bad we don't have post-census local review, which the House representative passed but was opposed by the, uh, the census Bureau and by the Democrats. Mr. Davis. I think I've only got uh, questions so left, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Pruitt, are there any post strata groups that, that we've conclusively determined to absolutely be the most difficult ones to enumerate or count? Um, well, based on our 1990 experience, we would expect a, a group that was made up of young African-American males in, in inner cities with, um, who rent uh, and who live in irregular housing that is they are unrelated to each other and so forth in that housing. That's likely to be a particularly uh, hard to count population group. Also based on 1990, though we think we've done a lot of work on this, uh, Indians living on reservations uh, with other sets of characteristics were more difficult to count. Age is actually a big factor in how well we count people. That's also true in the rural areas. By the way, the post rata structure, of course, includes a, a special post rata just for rural areas, and especially for rural areas where they rent, which we know to be a hard-to-count population group, highly mobile, and so forth. So we are, in that sense, the design takes care of, it, it sweeps across all of the problem situations in the country, not just fixed on the one. But yes, sir, we will have a particularly difficult time with that particular population group. Well, I thank you very much. I think it's been a very productive hearing, and I certainly want to thank you for your responses. And, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you, and I'm going to yield to uh, the ranking member here. I tell you, um, I'm getting tired of all of this, <laughs> of this constant, uh, constant effort, really, to disrupt the efforts of the professionals at the Census Bureau from doing their job and from correcting the undercount. And I would like to put in the record an article from the Washington Post written by David Broder entitled Playing Hardball on the Census. And I think he clearly puts into focus 
what's going on. And he says, in preparing for the showdown on the census, Republicans reshuffled the leadership of the House Census Subcommittee and hired its new staff director, Thomas Hoffler. This was back in 98, a PhD professor and battle-tested GOP strategist in redistricting. And he talks about meeting with Hoffler and how Hoffler goes uh, to a blackboard analysis of the Census Bureau's plans, uh, stressing the risks they see of serious miscalculation with untested techniques and a tight timetable. But as I was leaving, Broder says, Hoffler offered a decidedly non-academic comment. And he said, quote, someone, he said, should remind Bill Daly, the Secretary of the Commerce and Overseer of the Census Bureau, that if he counts people the way he wants to, his brother, Chicago Mayor Richard Daly, could find himself trying to run a majority-minority city, end quote. This is Hoffler talking. And Broder then explains this blunt reference to racial ethnic realities is not uncommon on either side of the fight. Among the thick file of scholarly papers Hoffler gave me was a memo entitled, Why Conservatives Should Be Opposed to Census Sampling. And it went on and said and warned in these papers, again, a direct quote from the Republican papers, a census that uses sampling and statistical adjustment will be the biggest victory for big government liberalism since the enactment of the great society to add millions of virtual people to big city population centers, thus increasing the political power and levels of federal government funding in those jurisdictions. Then came two pages of answers of how this outrage can be stopped. And it outlines the courts in Congress, the grassroots, and they are trying to do this. We have been to the Supreme Court. I understand there has been another suit uh, filed in Virginia against scientific sampling. And I remind my colleagues that two budgets have been held up. Anti-sampling language was attached to a disaster relief bill. And yet we have pages and pages of testimony that there is an undercount. We either correct it when the professionals have told us how to correct it, or we deliberately don't count people. That's what this hearing is about, whether we correct for the undercount or whether we do not, and therefore deliberately, not count people. Um, you got 30 seconds yeah. and... I, you, Ms. Maloney, <laughs> I just want to tell you, I just want to put for the record that where I come from, it's not a Republican-Democrat issue. Democrat, liberal Democrat politicians from my home state, Senator Herb Cole, Mayor Norquist of Milwaukee, are also opposed to sampling. We think it's bad for our state. We think the scientific community is out on this one. Uh, so I just want you to say it's not a conservative liberal thing, Republican Democrat thing everywhere. In some places it is. So it's just wrong to, to paint that very broad brush. With that I yield. Um, may I, may let I me respond? let me let me make my name was mentioned, may let I me respond? Ma may have my statement, please. If we're running low in time, we'll come back if you want. Um, I want to put in the record an editorial by Peter Scarry in last Sunday's Washington Post and it was titled We're overstating the importance of the undercount. And I think it's a good explanation of the fact we really are overstating the undercount. What this hearing was about was whether we were going to use statistical methods and adjustments to a census. There is real legitimate concern that the method will not work at the block level and to use it for the redistricting purposes. I think it was a good hearing. There are still a lot of questions to be answered. We'll be discussing this, I'm sure, for the next months ahead. But there is a real debate within the statistical community that the method will not succeed and that's the reason we've got to be careful. As Justice uh, uh, Scalia said, there is a potential political manipulation. Um, on behalf of the subcommittee, I'd like to thank you for appearing Can here I today. Respond? Well, we have a vote. We'll come Can back. If you want to come back. I would like to respond to what was uh, stated by Mr. Ryan. Uh, well, the Democratic if, Republican we will then uh, recess and we'll come back after we have I'd a I'd vote. I'd like to respond now for two seconds. Even if, you can, if you can do this in 15 vote. seconds, go right ahead. Otherwise, vote. I'm going to adjourn it here. Uh, my dear friend and colleague from Wisconsin, I mentioned that it was not a division 
between the Democratic and Republican Party. And he mentioned names in Wisconsin that supported his point of view. But there is a clear distinction between the two parties on a national level. From the president, who supports the use of modern scientific methods, to the entire leadership on the Democratic side. And I would like to put into the record statements that have been reported by the press quoting the Republican leadership that they will not let it go forward. Newt Gingrich called it a, a dagger in the heart Morning, of the Republican leadership. And Linder said, even if the court approves it, Ms. we will stop it. Ms. Linder. So when you say it is not a division between the two parties, Ms. it is. Ms. Maloney, it is we clear. need to. It is in the record not from my lips, but from the independent press. I would like to put those statements Ms. into Maloney, the record. Ms. Maloney, present the records right now. I mean, Ms. Maloney, come on. Now. We're trying it. to get a vote together. I mean, I you talk it. about, oh, let's go away from the partisanship, and all you want to do is go back to Newt Gingrich, who left Congress over two years ago, three years ago. This is 2000. We're in the middle of the census. So on behalf of the census uh, subcommittee, I want to thank you for being here today. I ask unanimous consent that all members, witnesses, uh, opening statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. In case there are additional questions that members have for our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent for the record to remain open for two weeks. For members to submit questions for the record and that the witnesses submit written answers as soon as practicable. Without objection, so ordered. Meeting adjourned. And I put the quote in the record from John Lender, the head of the RNC. Now. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, Don's right here. I'm just going to fill you in on. What were you asking? On the left of you, though? Everybody was sitting down. Nobody knows who knows, like, um, who does to talk to? I'm looking at Wick. Big forehead, very red face. Dark hair. Sitting in the very back row. I was talking about green. Not green. Or what's the name? Green. Green. I don't know. Yeah, I'm If you'd like more information on the 2000 census and related congressional hearings, check our website. The address is cspan.org. You're looking at a live picture of our homepage. On the upper right side of the screen, you'll see a box featuring the House Government Oversight Subcommittee.